thank you guys for coming. I would have felt real weird, weird talking to a wall. I wasn't sure how many people would have interest in this. Um, my name is Brian Lee. I uh, work at Clemson University. Um, uh, head of software development and uh, support. Um, the way I was originally envisioning doing this was uh, more or less like a case study. Just here's a problem we had, here's the methods and ideas, and by trial and error, and, and this was a five year work in progress what developed, what worked, what didn't work, and, and what the end result, and what we're planning on doing. Um, but then I got to, got to talking to uh, Rusty and Justin, and also, from my conference session yesterday, realized the ones to me that were the most interesting and the most fun were the ones that had the audience participating, and, and you guys are in the trenches just like me, so you're seeing this stuff and doing this stuff. So I'm kind of curious and interested what methods and ways you're handling uh, dual boot type deployments like this. Um, I think this one's a little different from just from where I've been talking with people at the conference yesterday. Um, most people were doing things like. Uh, deploy or Casper for, for handling that and having more of a centralized management. Um, but I don't think that's the only game in the world. Uh, depending on your situation and scenario, um, we do try to centrally manage our faculty and staff machines, of course, the university like everybody else, but our student machines, we don't want to manage. Um, it, give you a little background on Clemson. Uh, it's very similar to Penn State, it, other than we don't have multiple campuses. Um, we've got one large campus. But we're in a very small college town like this. It's in the middle of nowhere, right at the foot of the mountains. Um, the difference is we have a big lake right beside us, um, the, uh, and the nuclear plant uses it, and we have three-eyed fish and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> um, but small town, the population of the town is only about seven or 8,000 people. Uh, we have 25,000 um, or more students, undergrad and grad, together. So, of course, you know, they take over when they come in, and it's a ghost town when they're gone um, sort of situation. And none of us that work there live in that town, because that's a college town. You don't want to live there. Um, rents. 10 times as much, too. Um, but I'm curious to, to, to hear, like I say, more. So feel free to chime in at any point and, and give me some input or ideas or ways you do. I'm, I'm, just, I'm wanting to get more information from this. And to me, that's more enjoyable than listening to one guy sit up here and jabber the whole time. Um, I'm going to guess here. And is the main keyword that caught everybody's attention and decided to come the word BitTorrent? Because that's what I've heard for the past day. OK, thanks. Um, when I was thinking about the possibility of speaking here at Penn State, I was thinking about the different things that we had used and made. Um, for instance, one thing we made was an internal wireless installer that worked on 10.5 and 10.6. Um, that was a PETA major. Um, the, the getting that functional and working took nearly a year. Um, the good part about that is we've been able to uh, let a dozen to 20 other universities use it and piggyback and modify um, in multiple countries, Denmark, Australia, Canada. Um, but to me, that was kind of old news because that dealt with 10.5, 10.6, and wireless setup now with the mobile config type profiles um, are a lot easier with 10.7, and hopefully it'll remain that way in the future with 10.8 and so on. Um, the only other unique thing we had was the dual boot installer, and to me, just doing the main installer part wasn't very unique. Um, I, anybody could have done it, 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 approaching it from that method. I think the twist was BitTorrent, because when I was researching how to do it, I could find zero information about anybody ever possibly trying to do what we were wanting to do, um, especially not with the speeds and the size of the files that we were handling and dealing with. So there was a lot of trial and error, um, a good amount of time, and just tweaking and trying and seeing what would work best. Um, other possible titles we had for our that I'd thought about was just a legal use for torrents. To me, I got a kick out of being able to actually use BitTorrent for something legal. Um, and, and knowing that, not that I wouldn't use it for illegal, but that it actually does have a legal use. You know, it's, it's not a matter of, it's what, how people use it. You know, don't blame the technology, blame what they're doing with it sort of deal. Um, and of course, how to do make Windows fun for a change. Uh, this is probably one of the few sessions in here other than the one of converting Windows to Mac stuff that's probably going to have a detailed amount of stuff in Windows. I had to learn that myself. I'm an old MCP from back in the NT days, so it wasn't completely foreign, but I'd remove myself from that for like a decade, willingly, and kind of had to divulge back into that. Um, I work directly with our um, PC management and system center lab maintenance techs, so luckily I had a, a good group of guys to help me hold my hand through that and sing Kumbaya. Um, a little history about why we went with this method. Um, 
I originally worked in the printing and graphics industry and, and did IT management there. Migrated myself into education market because I don't enjoy the corporate world anymore. And worked with our school of education, a sub-college. We have five colleges within Clemson University. Similar to Penn State, I know in other universities, very decentralized. Everybody wants to do their own thing. You kind of have each college doing their own little pocket of stuff, but there's this umbrella of university-wide trying to support network and, and do things. Which I'm at the upper level now. I used to be at one of the, the colleges. Um, so I've dealt with faculty and staff directly, which has helped keep in mind when I'm making things, try to make it useful for not just, because now I do direct student support more so, but it's really university-wide. So I try to build tools that will work for all scenarios and situations. Not so much that I want to do the centralized management of the other people's areas, but if I can build tools that make their life easier, I earn good karma for that. Okay. Um, but one of my main duties for at least three months of the year is we hold student workshops throughout the summer. Um, we have orientation twice a week. They've let us take a small portion of the time where they've got the parents and the students walking all over our campus. None of it's flat. We are in the mountains um, for two days. So we get them at the end of the second day when they're hot, they're tired, they're exhausted, and then we stick them in a room and say, we're going to talk about computers and boring stuff for two hours. And you know, luckily I can kick the parents out. We have a good downtown with lots of bars, restaurants, tell them happy hour has begun. It's two in the afternoon, knock yourself out. It's been a long two days and, and we get them out. Because honestly, the parents talk more than the students in those situations. It's, or they want to handhold the student and they're 18, you gotta let them go. Anyway, we have these sessions throughout the, the summer. Um, so we generally get several hundred, anywhere from uh, 100 to 200 students at a time um, at just the max side. Um, we have about an equal number who are doing Windows machines. Um, when we started doing direct max support at the university level about six years ago, it was only about 5% MAC. The first year they announced a possible recommended buy for our students, it immediately went up to 25%. Um, I guess all the app, um, app advertisements just really caught their eye. And then the following year, we got an Apple store on campus, and it mushroomed even higher. Um, went to 45, 50, and we're cruising around 50, 60% of our entering freshmen now um, having max. As I used to tell my director, you see all these people and you've got uh, 50 people to do Windows support, hello, I'm the one Mac guy who's trying to handle all that. So it's, it's now the, the tables have turned in that situation. But to handle this, um, we, we decided to use automated installers for software deployment. Um, I don't if I can, yeah. A little more in the background of that. The first year when I moved into the upper umbrella and the first thing I was hit with was you're going to need to handle students and we don't know how many. That first year we had no idea. We didn't know if five people would show up at a session or a hundred. I had no clue to gauge because there had been no previous precedence for us doing that at the university, at least for a decade. They didn't touch Mac. We still had Macs on campus in the colleges, but university-wide, it was death by slow starvation. They just didn't give them anything. Um, so going in that first year, I only had a few months to prepare. We had to build everything, complete infrastructure, servers, uh, workflow, the whole bit from square one. And based on my background of doing faculty, staff, large deployments, lab systems, I went with imaging. Just seemed like the only logical solution for getting these machines. Plus, I was trying to mirror what the Windows side was doing since they had been doing this for years. And they had their machines imaged at the factory and coming in that way. Um, I think they were Lenovo at the time. Apple would do it, but of course it was like 50 bucks a pop to do it and nobody wanted to pay that. So the good thing is it worked great for a while. Um, we were using a combination of NetBoot and um, direct multicast imaging and had a little script built uh, program in the NetBoot so people could just pick and choose. Do you want a dual boot? No. Yes. How big do you want the Windows partition to be? Give them a few choices, and the rest was we'd walk out of the room, go get ice cream, literally, and then come back, and they'd all be done within 20 minutes. Um, the downside was, of course, a lot of these students weren't getting brand new machines. They were coming in with machines they'd been using for months, maybe a year, and so we're blowing out their music, movies, and hoping they have backed up their data. Gave us a real hinky feeling. Um, nobody complained. But the machines didn't belong to us. It didn't seem like the proper approach to erase their information off their equipment. Um, we were kind of overstepping our bounds a bit in that regard. Um, but it did work well until Apple changed hardware in the middle of the summer, which not only broke our image, but broke our entire imaging procedure. Everything went boom. I had nice, long, luxurious hair before that summer. 
um, ripped most of it out by the end. Uh, we got through it though, but then figured we'd go back, lick our wounds, and replan. Okay, this wasn't the way. We're throwing a hand grenade. We need to use a scalpel. And Apple had started preaching, get away from the monolithic approach of imaging. You really want to do more software overlays, very similar to what Deploy Studio and some of these other ones, but that wasn't around back then either. Um, so instead, we figured, well, we don't want to have to deal with these hardware changes in the middle of, of this mess. Um, why are we blowing out the operating system when they come shipped with one that works? Um, all we really want to do is overlay the software. So we developed Mac Software Installer that incorporates Office, other site license software, free software that our freshmen and most students use. Um, built the wireless installer, which took a year. And oddly enough, the easiest piece to build was a Windows dual boot installer. It literally took less than a week maybe three days to get it going and functioning fine. Um, however, when we were building it, and it, it was a very simple script, partition the drive, download the image from a web server, clone it. Very direct. No error checking. <laughs> Just told you it worked, even if it didn't. But it was functional. Got us going. The downside being, when we were maintaining the image, we were manually hopping the image through all the hardware we could get our hands on to try to get it to, to prompt. That way we could load the drivers. Um, it was a nightmare. Knew that wasn't the route to go, but it, it worked because there wasn't that many varying Intel motherboards. I mean, this was only a year or two in, and the Intel Core Duos and Intel Core 2 Duos were, were the only two and, and very small uh, group of those. Um, but it worked. We were also in the midst of focusing more on changing from XP to Vista. I cringe almost like I do when I hear Millennium anymore. Um, so we got through that year doing it with Vista, but doing it manually. Following year decided we're going to have to start doing this using SysPrep. It's the only way to survive. Um, the downside being we were losing time. These workshops that we had, we have a two-hour window that we have to set up all the user's software, wireless creature comforts, explain to them about how everything at the university works, where to go for help and put an entire second operating system, dual boot, Windows, the whole bit, if, if they want that or, or need it for certain majors. A very small time frame. So it was kind of a downside for us doing SysPrep because it easily added 20 minutes to the time of it having to go through the hardware. But the bonus was for us, maintenance-wise, we didn't have to try to get our hands on every possible Mac hardware, Apple hardware that we could, you know, could find. Um, plus, there was always going to be some oddball Mac Mini or Air or something that you couldn't get your hands on, and then it was going to be missing drivers. Um, so what we wound up doing, the idea was taking Apple's actual boot camp drivers and putting them in the image as well and having SysPrep use those. And we'll talk more about that as we get in. Um, after we got that piece working, again, work in progress each year, kind of chipping away at, okay, what's our next problem? What's our next bottleneck? The issue we were having, because we have extended the length of the install time beyond, there's basically a first half and a second half. The first half is the actual soft, the, the Windows dual boot installer, which runs on the Mac side, but net, which is 20 or 30 minutes normally. But now you've got another 20 on the back end where you have to reboot and let Windows get its brain straight because you just slapped it inside of something it doesn't know, Dell, Lenovo, God help you if it's a gateway, Apple, something of that nature. Um, and it has to work all that out. So we've, we've taken an already precarious situation where we only have a two hour window and have extended. It's made my life easier from a maintenance standpoint because once I've got all the drivers in there, I'm happy. But now everybody's paying on the back end for that because of that extra setup. Also, as the popularity of Apple grew on our campus and we went from that 25 to 45 to 50, 60 percent of our entering freshmen each year, we were getting larger and larger attendance at the workshops to where I have a room with, that holds almost 100 and that wasn't enough and we're having a second room with 30 and I got somebody else leading. And imagine you've got 100 people trying to download the same 10 gig file simultaneously from the same server. Takes, the server not only takes a beating, but the building itself takes a beating. The bandwidth is just completely clogged. So what we saw was our um, download time. If you were the only one running it at any other time, it was four or five minutes. Worked great in testing. And then you get in the real world situation and it's 45 minutes to an hour to download that same file because everybody's fighting for it, um, which made us running two and a half, three hours instead of two, and that wasn't good. And that's where BitTorrent came in. Um, 
kind of got the idea and concept. We found a little bit of information about some guys who were doing BitTorrent on some Linux systems <laughs> for um, some of the, I don't know, I think it was distro pushing, but it had to do with lab maintenance and lab management. And they were using it, they were in some situation where multicast for their network wasn't a good idea. And when they went with the BitTorrent, it, it gave them great results. So that's what made us decide to start trying it and testing it. Um, so in 2009, we started testing it, and we rolled it out in 2010. Worked great for the past two years, and I'm looking forward to using it for a third. Um, I'm hoping this year, and, I, and this is something I keep forgetting to do, to get data from our network people on the back end to see what's really happening behind the scenes in the backbone of the network infrastructure of the building. However, we're also changing buildings while we're doing it, so it's going to make it real inter interesting. Um, some of the ingredients. If you were wanting to build, just walking you through what we did. Um, this probably comes from my science background of here's your materials and methods. Um, various, there's a lot of varsity. If you're one of these people that like to be a jack of all trades and enjoy doing tidbits in lots of areas, this is for you. Um, of course, you're going to need Windows installation media. We have done this now through XP, Vista, and now we're on 7. Um, you're going to need to get familiar with the Windows Automated Installer Kit. Um, that was totally new territory for myself. That didn't exist in the NT days. Um, if you've ever done SysPrep before, I'm, I'm sure you've already um, dealt with it to some degree. Uh, essentially spits out an XML file that has uh, pre-set up, almost like a little manifest of, of things. Um, Apple Package Maker is the red-headed stepchild of Apple software, I think, at times. It's very useful and handy, and it's a shame they don't give more attention to it just because even Apple uses it for all their stuff. But when I've talked to the engine, there's like one, maybe two engineers that even do anything with it. They keep getting yanked off on iPhone projects and stuff. So it has very little attention given to it, yet it's such an important piece of software. Um, we immediately happened to be jumping in on it with Snow Leopard and a new version, which gave us the ability to make PKG package files that were all self-contained. So no more having to stick it in a DMG file for people to download. You could actually just post on the web direct. Um, the PKG and, and make it a clickable item. The, the benefit for us there is this is a situation where we don't want to manage. It's kind of a one-time push. We want to give people their software. We want to give them a Windows dual boot or settings for their computer, printing wireless, but we don't want to have to maintain that. Th these aren't our machines, they're the students. So Package Maker is beautiful for that if you can get familiar with it. Um, sadly, they don't have enough feedback stuff for you to be able to tie in to give better feedback to the users, my biggest complaint. Um, but uh, it works well for just dispersal. Plus, people are used to kind of seeing that, especially from Apple installers. It has the same look and feel. Uh, WinClone. I am happy to say WinClone is back. Um, I've been sweating the past year after uh, Two Canoes quit developing it and said they were never going to develop it, and then it didn't work with Lion, and then I got it to work with Lion, um, and then some Mountain Lion came and broke all my other stuff. I was really sweating what was going to happen with WinClone and what I was going to use as an alternative in the future. Um, it, in the in the day, was donationware, and we've definitely donated to them because of the amount of use we've gotten out of it. Um, in fact, I think we donated the week right before they announced they weren't supporting it anymore. Um, maybe they took the money and went to Jamaica. I don't know. But. Uh, it's been the biggest piece. It's the workhorse part that's doing it. We're using the command line tools that are built within it um, to do the actual cloning, which is really just kind of a series of Perl scripts. And we'll look at that some more in a moment. Um, but it works very well for just the actual cloning procedure. Um, various BitTorrent software. And this is where it gets kind of hinky and, and thick. You'll notice I've got multiple ones named because we're using multiple BitTorrent softwares depending on the situation and the scenario. Um, and I'll explain why in a moment as we, we get into that. Uh, use the best tool for the job. Some have you know, pros and cons in different areas, and just through trial and error testing, we kind of learned, well, this one does this part better, but this one does this, and so that's why we've, we were using multiples. Luckily, they all talk well to one another. Uh, web server. Of course, we're posting all of this on a website and telling our students, don't come bother us. Go to this web page. Click a link. You can, you're welcome to stay. We'll help you. You can wait for in line for an hour or two. Or you can go back to your dorm, turn on a football game, Jersey Shore, whatever floats your boat. Hit the, hit the button and watch the progress bar, and you'll be done. You know, the Mac software stuff's done in about 15, 20 minutes. Wireless is a minute. Windows is less than an hour, about 40, 45 minutes. Sit in your room. By the time the show's over, you're done. You know, 
Come see us if something blows up, smoke blows out, you pour coffee in your laptop, or your roommate does vile things with it. But other than that, that way that helps us focus instead of just helping people walk through installs, although you still get that certain percentage that are either lazy, don't want to learn, or really just don't know how. But you can focus with those now and let people who are self-sufficient enough to do it on their own. Our data has shown that 70% of our student population does it at their dorms. They don't come to our so we only get to see about a third of the people that we would have been seen if we hadn't done it in that method. Um, the part dealing with the tracker, um, and we're doing this all on one server, which you could spread the load if you felt necessary. Um, we have MAMP installed, which actually helps communicate with, we're using Rivet Tracker for the actual seed tracker. Um, we'll go more through that too. iHook is a free piece of software. I'm sure some of you guys have probably seen it or used it before. It's just a handy way to get feedback back from uh, certain script languages that don't inherently give the user any feedback, Bash, Perl, Python, some of those things. Um, and we're using that. After the first year, we didn't have any feedback. We just had the package maker and say, look, it works. The problem was it would go, you have one minute remaining. And it would say that for 20 or 30 minutes. And so after about 15, the user would get kind of sweating and this is froze and they'd force quit or shut their machine and just booger up the whole thing. So feedback was good. Letting the user know it's okay. We'll hold your hand, pet you. It's, it's still working, just be patient. Um, and of course, favorite script editor, because you are going to have to do some tinkering and programming around to, to make things work in the long run, especially as things change. OK, this is the boo hiss part. Um, we're going to delve into Windows a bit. Um, essentially, how many of you guys in here are actually already doing some sort of Windows image building and deployment and push? Um, how many of you are using Deploy Studio to do that, push around? Okay, Casper, how many? Um, specifically Max. I'm, I don't do Windows. I mean, I, I do Windows, but I try not to. But I'm, I'm speaking specifically Apple hardware for doing that. Well, what other things are y'all using? We, we use Deploy Studio, but we use it just to like, create the partition, and then we go back through and actually install Windows on that. Okay, so, but you're doing it as like a one-time push yeah. type thing. Too. Okay, yes. I'm looking to try and do it with uh, Linux FS Archiver. But Interesting. I, it's on my, to, I have to do this next week, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> no rush, no pressure, no pressure. Um, okay, I was just wanting to kind of get a feel for how you guys are doing it out there. Fog? Never heard of that piece of software. Is that? It doesn't handle Macs yet. Okay. So it's, we're looking to integrate Fog and Deploy Studio because the Deploy Studio PC side is pretty unsophisticated. But if we can convince the Fog Project people to share a database, then they can do. That would be nice. Fogproject.org, it's uh, free open source goes. Very nice. Um, there was another method I had heard. Oh, you'll laugh. I've actually used Ghost before <laughs> with doing Macs. It'll. You can boot a Mac in DOS with the right disk. Um, yeah, Ghost will fly, it'll work, you can boot them in. Uh, yeah, back in the just tinkering days. Um, we actually, just a side note, um, within three days after Apple announced Boot Camp back in Tiger, um, we had a triple boot Mac running. Um, we had already been toying with doing a Mac dual boot before that because I think some guy had released some info and a guide and how you could slipstream the XP. And Anyway, me and a coworker were tinkering with it and we had just finished, we're in the middle of burning the slipstream disk when he's like, hey, did you see this email Apple sent out about this thing called Boot Camp? We're like, threw everything away. And, oh, this is wonderful. This is something we spent three days in that. Anyway, so we immediately were like, well, that was too easy. Let's triple boot it and grabbed a couple of Linux guys and ended up getting it to work and we were all standing at this Mac Mini and four of us all proud and look at the marvel we've created and then after a day it was like what are we going to do with it and two weeks later we wiped it and put the mac os back on it and it was just a matter of saying we conquered the mountain we knew we could do it um but yeah you could use uh, oddly enough back then uh, several different imaging tools unfortunately things like ghost and stuff were windows based and since we were wanting this to be Mac side, we needed an actual Mac cloning type mechanism. We've even toyed with doing system center deployments um, through it, but we have a bit of issues with certain drivers and stuff to get that going out. Um, if anybody's doing anything like that, I'd love to get info from you. You're using yeah, system center. We started out doing, um, you know, deploying just a monolithic image with Deploy Studio. Mm -hmm. And then a year ago, we switched over to MDT and we're going to migrate to system center, but I think based on this light bulb that went off yesterday in my head that 
you might just go back to the monolithic image. Well, the benefit for us. MDT just, there's just a lot of overhead. We're now just about. For us, 80, 90 percent of the users of this are students. It's not something we're managing. We're here. You need Windows for engineering or whatever course? Wham! There you go. You got Windows. Go away. Because they're only licensed. We have a site license from Microsoft, so we're we're free to throw it on any machine that'll run it. But when they leave the university, it doesn't. We don't want to maintain an update and deal with that. When they go and it dies, then no oh well, you're you're done. Um, so for us, this worked well. Now for our faculty staff who also use this installer, it's great just to get it in there. We have users that will even tie parallels, VMware, whatever into that. Um, now that those software products can, can do it from a VM type solution. Um, or if we have people in the local colleges, if they do want to maintain and deal with that, they're welcome to join the domain, tie it into System Center, and they can have scripts and tools to do that. That's kind of as a, a secondary thought. Uh, this is just quick and easy because it's one thing, one person build and maintain it, and it works university-wide and, and um, works for all hardware as well, which we're going to talk about. Um, but anyway, as you would uh, normally do when you're building images, get your build, patch all the software, get it up to date, um, add any additional software like for us, Office is the biggie um, that most users. Um, we've actually had requests from engineering and other areas to put AutoCAD and SolidWorks and all, but the images would be so massive, there's no way there's enough time in a day to, to push that out. So it's a lot easier to let those people do those installs later um, through a separate automated system. Um, and any other creature comforts that you might want to set within your image. Just basically build it the way you've already been doing. Nothing new there. Um, for those of you who don't know, is there anybody not familiar with audit mode or sysprep in here? Hasn't done it? Um, next week. Next week. Um, I'm glad you're an insomniac because you're going to have some time dealing with it. Um, this is not what you would need to go into the very first time you were ever building one. Um, but thinking down the road, maintenance, anytime you're wanting to update that image, hopefully regularly, because uh, if you wait too long, of course, you're going to have 138 updates from Microsoft that can't be done at once. You have to reboot and do and reboot and do as usual. Um, to enter the mode, you do shift control three before you log in and it enters, it, it basically jumps in because what happens is you're going to capture this image and sysprep essentially is saying you don't know who you are. You'll figure it out later, but your Windows, but when you get on the machine, set up all your hardware, figure out what your keyboard, video, sound, processor is, and then, you know, nestle in there and, and you're good to go. By entering audit mode, you interrupt that process. You allow Windows, after it's been cloned, to set up the hardware, but when it hits that secondary stage of setting up actual accounts, um, within the operating system, you jump in and say, wait, don't finish this prep. Let me slide in here. Then you can do your updates, maintain, change software, um, items of that nature. Um, and then you can turn around and say, okay, reinitiate this prep and it goes back to square one. Um, that way you never actually finish the sys prep process. Otherwise you get things SIDS, get tied to the machine, um, all kinds of reasons not to let that sys prep process finish. Uh, first boot after. Uh, what we will do is like, say, I wouldn't enter this the first time I've built the image, but for maintenance down the road. So second, third, I'm just going to take a machine, a raw, hit it with my installer, let it go through 80% of the process, but then before initial login, I'm going to initiate audit mode, slip in there, do my updates, get everything tweaked the way I want, fix any bugs I might have, and then I'll engage sysprep to go back and it, it generalizes the machine again. Wipes its memory and says, okay, you don't know what system you're on. And that way, I never let sysprep complete, so I'm not using... What is it? There's like the KMS activations that get used. There's SIDs that get set up with the accounts. What's some of the other reasons? Um, now there's a lot of things that makes it a unique machine if you finish that and you don't want to get to that point um, or else you're going to be rebuilding your image from scratch again. Um, unfortunately, that's one part I haven't been able to really get doing. I would love to do um, like InstaDMG where you can script a lot of your creation and building, but because we're hopping operating systems and there hasn't been an easy way to script, I, there might be ways to do small portions of it, but not the entire process. So there's a, a, it's a good solid work day anytime I maintain or update the image of just walking it through the paces of everything. But you gain all that back on the back end. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, this part's a little different. Um, Prepare the drivers provided by Apple. And this is one thing I'm not sure a lot of people are doing. Before where we were 
manually hopping the image through hardware just to get Windows to prompt us for drivers so we knew what to install. We're taking the extra initiative before we would ever even get to that level because it got to be a nightmare. Um, it got to where if we tried to move the image onto newer hardware, we were getting blue screens of death. We were having to rebuild the image from scratch constantly every time new hardware came out. Tried it, it worked, and has worked great so far um, for three years now. We take the boot camp drivers that Apple already provides. You can get them off the installed media that comes with the machine. Generally, you're going to, of course, have to get it off the latest hardware disk. Um, but then you can get the updates from Apple off the website. If you take that and crack those open, and I've been using uh, RAR Expander, RAR, RAR, I've heard it pronounced both ways. I'm in the south, so we draw everything out a little longer. Um, you're able to actually bust open a lot of those EXE files and get it down to the DOLs, INFs, and just essentially crack all that open. And, and I'll show you some of that in a little bit. Um, and what that does, and then we're allowed to actually leave those drivers in the image. Um, as long as Apple keeps providing those drivers, this is working great. And I'm hoping they do continue. I don't I think they'll have plans not to. Occasionally, you might get a driver that's not quite right. Apple does tend to lag because you're coming from the software vendor and then Apple gets it and then rolls it into boot camp. And so there might be a few month lag. There's been a few occasions where I've had to actually go track down a Broadcom driver of a certain tweak. Oh, they had a bug fix and, and get that. And then I just slide that into the, but I essentially have a group of cracked open drivers that's all possible Apple hardware. Minis, MacBook Airs, Mac Pros, you name it. Every now and then we have one we have to tweak, but for the most part, the drivers are there. So now I don't have to worry about the hardware. This should just work for everything. Um, so you're going to want to have those drivers set up, prepared, and up to date to whatever the latest version. The benefit there also is once I've got this prepared, as Apple issues a new uh, update, you know, 3.1.2 comes out, and if it has a new driver for a specific, because some driver got updated, you can just pluck that out and pop it right in and just replace. Um, the boot camp software would need to be installed separately, so you are still going to need to install the actual control panel in the image and have it in there. You don't want that to run as a separate thing. And any additional cleanup um, you may want to do, uh, be it um, defragging your hard drive, um, clearing out any temp cache, whatever you can do to help shrink that image size down um, of the final footprint of the installation. For us, we go a very simple route. We just dump our drivers in a folder right in the root of the hard drive called drivers. Um, and then we have the trick here is adding that registry redirect. Um, in HKEY local machine, you dig down deep enough um, and you're essentially telling this command instruct sysprep, okay, when you're setting up for the very first time for the hardware, look in, the in, look in Windows operating system for drivers, but also look here because this is where we know the drivers really are. Um, I think that does add some additional, so our sysprep times are actually a little longer because it's looking through more files. And if you look through the logs, it's going through all of this. For every driver, it digs through all the directories over and over, looping through. But that's fine because we don't have to worry about hardware issues as much that way. Um, right. Yes? Do you, have, do you have just the raw files in that driver's directory, or do you have them in there, you know, folder or subfolder? Um, if you crack open the boot camp driver set, they're already fairly separated by manufacturer. There's an Apple folder, Broadcom, Cirrus, yep. on down the line. Um, the, I actually do a good fair amount of weeding. Just I like to trim and clean. At first I get things functional, then I go back and really try to shape it and make it look smooth. Um, for instance, there's a slew of text files that are just license files. Don't tell the vendors, but I gut those and toss them away. Nobody's going to see that junk anyway. Um, I've gutted it to where it's only 64-bit drivers. We're only deploying a 64-bit image and have been doing so since Vista. We immediately just took the leap since the Apple hardware could do it um, and went 64-bit and, and have never had, really had a complaint since. Um, so I got all 32-bit versions that I can de determine actually are only 32-bit versions. I try not to break anything if we can help it. So it's a very, it's actually about half the size of the full boot camp set once you knock the 32-bit out and weed out any other files. Uh, but it's essentially, if you're looking at the directory, it's just directory structures with INFs, DOLs, um, CAB files, things of that nature that sysprep can, oh, yep, here's one and it tells us, INF says this is that driver for that hardware. And, but you don't have and subdirectories it, under drivers. 
Yes. Oh, yeah. Ooh, I do. Uh, SysPrep will dig through all of those. And that's what I was saying with the part that I think it extends the SysPrep operation by maybe a couple minutes. Um, but it's well worth the five minutes that I'm not, yeah, no, I don't lump all that in one because maintenance. For me, I'm thinking down the road, not now how hard. Uh, for instance, our engineering area has always wanted me to rebuild MATLAB, Maple, all these installers and put them in our software installer. I looked into it. I was like, I could do it. It'll take a few weeks, maybe a month to really work it and tweak it the first time. The problem is maintenance. Twice a year, they're going to issue an update. So I'm having to reinvent the wheel for a week every couple times. No, I, and I just back off. It's not a matter of doing it the first time. First times, I can get through that. I don't want to continue to be doing that for year and year after year. Same thing with this. I, when I've got the drivers and they're separated by manufacturer, and then Apple comes along and drops a boot camp update, and it's only a Broadcom driver was the only thing new. Well, great. I can go straight to that directory, switch out the pieces, and I'm done. And, and I know I haven't affected anything else. And SysPrep luckily will dig through all those directories and find everything. The trick, though, is having that one key registry edit made. Yes? I actually do mine uh, slightly different way. Rather than including the drivers on the actual boot image, um, you can actually specify a network path in that same area. At least I do it in the unattended file. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I just make sure that the network drivers are on there, obviously, so you can get to the network. Right. And then afterwards, you just have a network share where you constantly are updating the drivers on that one share. Mm -hmm. And when the computer boots up for the first time and you know, starts looking for drivers, it pulls them all from the open. That's a good idea. That way, rather than having to update the image with the drivers each time, you're just updating one network share and it pulls them from there each time. Yeah, that's a thought. My only fear with doing that is we already have enough network issues in the regard, which is why we go to BitTorrent, and adding any more stress to that in a volatile situation of people already pounding the network to death and me relying on being able to get to that network for the drivers, knowing I'm going to have 100 people all hitting that simultaneously would would. Mm, that'd make me scary uh, just a little bit. It, it, to me, it's not so much a problem in the maintenance because since I'm updating the drivers in the image, at the same time I'm updating software, doing patches and updates, it's just another step in the process, and I know they're there and available. So even if the network went boom, it's going to finish completion. It can sysprep without the net. In fact, we've had students at the sessions be in a hurry to catch an airplane, and they're like, okay, the Mac thing finished, but now i got to do the reboots. We're like, just close your machine. Do that at home. You don't, you don't even have to be. Once it's past the download portion, you can unplug and walk around campus. The machine will just, everything's automated. It's all internal. So we've, we've got the safety net of knowing once they get past downloading, everything else should work from that point on. And they could honestly close it, go home, and we've had people six months later crack it open, boot to Windows, and it goes through SysPrep, and now they're going to have updates, and they're going to need antivirus updates, but um, it's there. It's just sitting waiting to creep out and jump on the machines and stuff. Um, any other questions on the registry? Yeah. Actually, I had a comment and then a question. Um, uh, with the answer file, I think you can actually use a component um, that tells it to look for specific uh, drivers folders. So you don't, like, it's, it's doing it the same way he's doing it, I guess, mm -hmm. except you're not going for a network driver, you're looking for the you know, C code and you know, drivers folder. Right. Um, so you don't have to edit the registry. Okay. It's another alternative. It's doing the same thing pretty much. But actually have it in the unattend XML yeah, so file. You don't, like, that way you don't mess around. Mess around with I think we tinkered with it once and had trouble and couldn't get it to, see, to fly. And we might have been doing it wrong. And that's why I asked my question. Because my experience, it never would recurse subdirectories. And we always did it in the past. We've had issues with that. We've yeah. yeah. had so many drivers over, over the time. Like, mostly dull drivers, but that's what we have. Right. But occasionally we had stuff from HP. And you've got it separated into subdirectories by category, yeah. And then at the end of it, we have a command that deletes the entire drivers folder, so that you know. The user Which yeah, and that's that's where we get the savings. Rather than your benefit is you're saving space in the image and on the final drop that you don't have drivers eating up hard drive space because it's stored elsewhere. And we're doing a similar to what you're saying, where we have it actually stored. Um, wow, well, I thought that was on the next slide in there and we have a cleanup script that once it's finished it just wipes it out so you regain that. Uh, and the whole driver sets only 700 megs, if that, maybe in that range. So it's not a huge amount. I mean it's lots of individual files though. Are you also automating the installation of um, bootcamp itself in the answer file? It's a, I know it's an MSI package. I don't know if you guys... We're not doing it as an MSI. 
Uh, we did toy with that idea at one time, especially when we were looking at system center type deployments, um, because we were considering having something that would just, you set up all the Mac software at a workshop and then have it reboot the machine and tie into system center with the Pixie boot and, and latch into that to get the, the original push down. Um, we've had various driver issues trying to get that working and, and, and situated. Um, but it's definitely a route we're, we're still considering and looking at. The only other fear I have with that is, again, that mass of hundreds of students hitting a uh, system center at one time. I will make enemies, possibly, um, at our institution. Uh, so. the uh, boot camp installer in the street, uh, Slipstream installer. Slipstream off of? Uh, if, you take, if you're installing Windows 7, you take your Windows, install a CD, and you, you add That'd be tricky. I'm not comfortable enough in Windows to try it. Mm -hmm. And that would, once we got to that level, I would be buying my uh, system center admins lunch regularly and soothing and petting them into doing it. Because I'm, when you get to that deep of a level, I'm out of my venue there, and I will learn it, but I don't know it off the top of my head, so I would definitely go with it. But that's definitely a good idea to try. Um, I hadn't even thought about a slipstream. The only difference there is you're getting off, you're using some sort of solid media, but that does alleviate the network issue. You, don't, you, don't, um, you can still turn your slipstream image into an ISO and, then do and push that way. Magic with it. It's just you're replacing the stock Windows 7 installer by a right. custom version. I the only downside. Stream CDs for servers because they, you know, they won't recognize a disk if you don't have this uh, RAID controller exotic driver in your installer. So I make a Slipstream Windows 7 that's got those drivers pre-built, so then I can boot off this uh, modified media and be able to see my RAID. I'd be curious time difference of doing an actual installation from scratch versus cloning an already built image would be the only for, for my scenario, my situation, because we're in a very limited time factor there. Um, and generally installs are going to take a little longer. Maybe the boot camp installer does too much logic to be so it Might be. Might be too deep. Um, of course, we're using the Windows Automated Installer Kit to create what we were just talking about, an uh, unattend file. Um, for those of you not familiar with it, it's just an XML file. Um, actually, I think I got a picture of one. Yeah, which you're not going to be able to read at all. Um, it's just a set of, com of settings. For instance, some of the things we do within our unattend file, um, go ahead and enter the Windows product key that's in there. Um, we have it, go ahead and set up an admin account by default with password built in. Um, that way, if we need a backdoor into the machine, the user's locked out or something, we can, can get in. We don't leave that on by default, so when sysprep runs, it actually deactivates the admin account, so when the user gets a machine, there's an admin account that exists, but it's disabled. That way it's not a security risk for us. Um, oddly enough, the Windows side, when they're shipped from the company, they still have an admin account that all our student employees know the password to, and I'm not getting into that, though. Um, and then, of course, we have to add that sysprep. Once you've prepared it and created it, um, the Windows Automated Installer Kit, which is two gigs of fun installing to make a little teeny XML file, um, you, you get this XML spit out, and then it's just a matter of storing it in your image as well, and then we're going to redirect sysprep to look at that for um, methods and, and ways to set up that image and to prepare it. Oh, we have out-of-box experience, generalize, all those steps in there so that it, it tells it to scan for hardware changes and new pieces there to see what kind of hardware you're on. Yes, sir. Um, I have a, you know, like I said, I haven't done sysprep in a long time, so is there still ways in the, uh, currently in sysprep to do logic? So to bind some settings to a, a table of MAC addresses if you have a... I put that out there to you guys who are more familiar with sysprep than I. I'm doing 5% of what sysprep can probably do. I'm just trying to generalize the image, get a product key in. I'm doing like five or six minor things just to get it ready. You guys familiar with sysprep know an answer to that? Or could you hear? I don't know. Um, uh, can you do logic in the sysprep so that can, let's say I just have a sysprep machine right. that are specific demands? Uh, for instance, I don't have a lab uh, well, key for Windows. I have it. So if you're for this MAC address, use this setting. I mean, this kind of there's like there's um an optional component in the 
actually let it run like you know different scripts. So you have like a VB script, um, an AC script, you know different scripts, and you can put it in there if you want. So it actually will take in Visual Basic. Yeah. So you can actually run like that's with the MSI stuff. Like you can actually tell it, hey, look, run MSI exec and mm -hmm. run you know the bootcamp installer and you know, but it's still yeah. Yeah. It doesn't crash and burn on you there by not having the well, graphics yet. Okay. Okay. Now we had. We had considered at one time having the actual boot camp installer just run as more like a postscript action after imaging is done. Um, and then that would make the process even easier because we wouldn't be cracking open drivers. We could just, you know, piggyback an update on top of another or whatever. Um, but we're, for, again, adding length to the time of the install was the main hurdle there for us. Mm -hmm. Uh, this one, again, it's a little more hands-on and, and a handful maintenance-wise on the front end, but uh, you, you gain a good bit of that back because the user is getting an already set up machine when it hits and, and chugs through all the sysprep. Um, I, I will say, however, um, two summers ago, the last half of the summer, Apple had done a hardware change. and. White MacBooks, and only about four in ten of them had a problem where it would just in sysprep. Narrowed it down to an audio driver. Took about a month of machines just dying and flaking out, and and you know the the problem there being one to another. I think it was a revision of the audio card. They were different in the machines that were getting shipped to the students. And you could, I mean, we were cracking machines open, looking at hardware serial numbers, trying to narrow down the problem. And there was very little feedback. You, you start having to, if you, I'm sure you've dug through the sysprep log stuff. It's a nightmare. Um, and when contacting, I'm dealing with Apple and Microsoft and getting the, it's not our fault, it's his fault, it's not our fault. And we don't, you know, cover you for boot camp. And, well, you're doing really weird things Mother Nature never intended, and all bets are off, and good luck. To let us know what you figure out, you know, that sort of a situation. Um, so that when you get into that troubleshooting level where you're having a problem, it's, it's, it's a bit of a dig to ever get anything um, because it's not completely clear. Essentially, the way to figure that out if you get a problem like that, the sysprep logs, you have to kind of figure out where they cut off. It's not a matter of something errored, it's just when the log just stops writing stuff. And it may not necessarily be where it died because sysprep's got multiple things going on at one time. So you might be looking at a log chasing a wild goose because that just happened to be where that log was when this part over here died and froze up the whole operation. So it, it, that was a bit of a nightmare um, as well. That, that was the one big hurdle I've ever had to deal with, with with this. And that was just, like I say, it was an oddball. I finally found a new revision of an audio driver, narrowed it down to even being an audio problem, which was half the battle. Knowing is half the battle, go Joe. Um, and once you got it down to that point, it was just a matter of figuring out revision differences and, and fixing it. So, yes, sir. On that same point, I uh, was doing a dual boot on an iMac 81, and the audio on the speaker is built into the iMac. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess one of my questions is, in order to get it to work, I had to go back to Bootcamp 2.0 drivers to get it to work on that model. Interesting. So my question is, when you do your preparing with drivers and whatnot, are you only putting in, like right now, Bootcamp 4.0 drivers, or are you putting in 3.3.1, 3.2? Bootcamp 4 is out? Yeah. Oh, crap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Uh, I know what I'm doing Monday when I get back to work. Um, we're usually going with the latest and only tweaking when we have a particular issue that we know of. For instance, right now I know there is a, is it audio? I think it is. It's an audio driver issue with a certain model iMac that, but I've only had one complaint from one user ever about it. 
and it was one of those deals. We fixed it on that machine. We're like, eh, we could kind of roll that in, but you're always fearful it could break something else. And, and that's going back to a Windows mindset, 90% of your issues for anything like that is going to be a driver or a driver version um, and trying to figure that out um, when you're doing it. Um, usually I've gotten very lucky. The latest drivers generally work with everything. Um, occasionally when I've had problems, it's because there's been some tweak that they've made to a driver because of that problem, you know, and finally got word of it. And, and there might be a month or so lag time between the manufacturer actually submitting it or going on that ghost hunt of trying to find those drivers at whatever vendor's site and pluck those in. 99% of the time, I'm pretty okay with the boot camp stuff. It, it, they keep it pretty well up to date. And the benefit for me is it handles all the the hardware I don't even get or see. I feel comfortable that my image is probably going to mostly work. You might on occasion, like a Mac Mini, might have a oddball Bluetooth driver or something you might have to tweak. But my main concern, 99% of the machines that run this are uh, MacBook Pros and MacBooks. So, And that's what mostly our faculty and staff have, uh, with a small portion of iMacs and an even smaller portion of Mac Pros and maybe a few Minis floating around. And we just kind of step on the airs and kick them under a table when they yes. come by because they're just a hassle to deal with anyway. Yes? Has anybody found a way to run the whole boot camp installer silently? Not that MSI? No, not just the, no, the whole thing that installs the drivers in addition to... You mean like the boot camp assistant in OS X? No, I mean the... The actual executable the that... The actual executable that goes out and expands everything. I know when I've tried through command line, there was no way to call it silently. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. yeah, I just extract the EXE that you get, and there's an MSI in there, and I just throw the QD. Mm -hmm. at it. But that's just for the control panel. Yeah, it'll get it the drivers, too. When I run it, the, the bootcamp 64 to MSI will install the drivers. Mm -hmm. If you're having some issues, something else I ran into with getting it, there was a bug at one time uh, back in Vista days where we were having to call the 64-bit MSI through an admin command prompt. You couldn't just click on it and you couldn't do it through a normal one. You had to specifically go to an admin command prompt to get it. Otherwise, it would just and, and bail out on you. But I'm sure they fixed that by now. But that bug may pop up again one day. You never know. That's the benefit of uh, the audit, uh, audit mode. True, true, yeah. The, uh, what's funny is, well, yeah, that's kind of sad. Um, this is an XML file. Uh, it's much longer than this, and like I said, I didn't realize the projector was going to be this small because I've actually got Easter eggs in there for you to find. Um, um, yeah, well, when we present, I'm going to give the whole slideshow to do. There is a couple websites you might want to jot down later that have... Um, I actually have a link uh, posted later in the show that has the main installer script that I've tried to generalize as much as possible. So if you guys want to modify it for your area, um, I didn't include our sysprep, but I can easily, I'll put that in with it if you want it. Um, I wouldn't use this sysprep because like I say, I've, I've, it's one for my environment and things that have like hashed passwords, I've changed that stuff obviously, um, with lots of little Easter eggs and song lyrics and stuff. But you, it could give you a basis of comparison. You could load that right into the... Um, that's the, another cool part with the Windows Automated Installer Kit is you could take an already prepared XML and feed it, not just generate them, but also feed it in, edit, modify. And we've had to do that. Um, uh, we're using MAC, um, MAK for the licensing um, for our student population. Uh, we also run KMS as well. Um, but uh, periodically that changes as we run out of seats and licenses. And so I have to go in once a year or so and actually modify that product key to tie in with that and update that in the image and, and to, to fix that problem. Um, uh, beware. The sysprep XML file is all powerful. Treat it with awe and respect because it will bite you when you're not looking. For instance, I get the note, oh no, we ran out of my Windows licenses. Everybody's machines are asking for product keys. Ah, okay, well give me the new key, I'll put it in the image. And so I go into actual Windows and enter the new product key and save and clone and do and, di and they're still broke because I didn't update the auto unattend file. It overrides whatever you have in the image. Me not realizing that I thought that would stick. It doesn't stick. This will clear that out. 
Um, I actually, as part of my procedure, reactivate mine. When I go into audit mode, I kick it from MAK to KMS, just so it's not using up licenses um, for that. But because I know my sysprep is going to undo that when it runs. So how, so. Do you, how do you handle, let's say it's like your KMS server went offline, like when it's actually doing it? No, 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 no. It's like I've run into the same problem. Like, we have like rolling blackouts in our KMS server on campus. And I go into a lab, yeah. No, no. How do you sleep at night? No, no. Yeah. Don't think about yeah. such thoughts. Yeah, you put in tickets and then it's in there like, uh, oh, it's down. Oh, no, no, no. No, uh, we had that issue. In fact, I had a long talk with a guy who's not here tonight on the bus riding back out of the woods um, about, he's actually at a sister college, well, not sister, but actually a rival college um, in the next state of you got to have a solid data center. Um, when I first moved up to the um, upper umbrella, our data center was, I'm being recorded, I can't say the words. Um, we had daily outages campus-wide. The power couldn't handle anything. So if it wasn't one system, it was all systems. Um, the first thing our new CIO came in and said, this is a pile of junk. Got it. And, and we had like a two-year roadmap, and they invested millions of dollars. And the first thing had to do was bring Duke Power, which is low power, come in and redo. Because our day-to-day -day usage was above the, the – and I know he said the same thing at UNC. Their generators run all day because they have to generate extra power because their power load can. So they're in that situation we were in a few years ago, where you've just grown outside of your, your shell and, and you're bursting at the seams. There's you can't put a price on that stability um, because look at you're having to think about what ifs and powers and granted think about what ifs but it shouldn't be something that large and an investment in that is is you can't can't you get that back tenfold return wise so we finally grew we've got like the largest data center in, in the southeast uh, supercomputer that's like seventieth in the top one hundred um, with no destruction we've been able to bring outside corporations buying our data center space at our not-profit university to, to do these things and run our state Medicaid system and do, I mean, we've, we've been able to grow that and we have stability. We've had one outage in like five years. It was a big outage, and that's a whole different story, but had nothing to do with power, had nothing to do with, with bits and pieces or a system, you know, just because of that infrastructure's got to be there. And that's why I don't even want to think, because I have bad nightmares from those days of getting those 2 a.m. phone calls and texts, and this is out and that's out. And I mean, it was every night, every day. Um, people just couldn't work. I mean, anyway, I'm preaching to the choir here. You guys know this. Um, yeah, I try not to consider those sort of situations, because hopefully even if that did happen, one, it's not my problem, but which makes it all the better. But hopefully that would be up soon. So um, for me, the KMS is a small portion. I'm only doing that when I'm updating an image. So I would just wait a day. And they get the system up, and then I'm good to go. Um, for us, the MAK is, is all. It, it rules. And our systems, the way we're set up, they have to be on campus at least once every six months, once a year, to hit that server to, to keep their Microsoft stuff genuine and activated. So they either have to VPN if they're abroad or, you know, come to campus if it's a home machine or something. Um, and again, this is a lengthy, very boring looking XML file. Um, it's a lot prettier when you're in the actual software. Um, I would say it's not clear, user friendly as far as what's doing what. You're going to see lots of the same settings in different layers. And there is a Zen-like method of what should be done at what layer. I don't know that. I've relied on my cohorts at, at my department to help me with that because they know more and there's always Google to go search or well, actually when you're looking for Microsoft Bing Act works a lot better than Google for that sort of stuff. Um, and of course we were talking about uh, the cleanup. Um, I have another script just added there that's just straight command script runs on first boot that goes in and purges those drivers presuming you've gotten past the hardware setup. We've used all the drivers we need. Those have been moved into the operating system folder. We're just trying to clean up the mess that's behind now. And those are the commands. Was didn't know if anybody was right in that. No. It's easy information to find. Again, it'll be in the slide. The downside to having that built into the image is when I go in for maintenance, I let it set the hardware. It purges those drivers, and then the first thing I do is put the drivers back into my image. So, but you just have to remember to do that. 
Um, and here's the actual command where you're calling sysprep, which I'm sure most of you, and that's just more or less pointing sysprep at that unattend file so it knows how to prepare. It'll go through, take a few minutes to process, and then Windows will shut down and, um, and you're good. Be very careful not to boot that back into Windows because it is ready for first time deployment. Um, if you do, remember to go into the unattend audit mode. It's not unattend, audit mode, so you can get back out of that. Uh, I've only made that mistake once, I think. And yay, that's the end of the Windows stuff. Um, we're, we're not going to, we'll hit it a little bit more um, later with some of the later sysprep hardware. But the rest of everything, now that you've, you, that was all prep work. Getting yourself ready, getting an image that's built for that environment and ready to be deployed massively and be fresh so it'll work on Apple hardware. That, that's a huge burden that's taken off your plate once you've got that made and prepared. The only downside is having to routinely go in, run your updates, and rewalk through that process. I just have, personally, a little script guide so I don't forget anything, walk through and do it. Um, if there's any ways to automate some of that process, I'm all ears, because I would love, I'm lazy like the rest of you guys, and want to do as little as possible. That's why I got into programming and scripting. So anything that could automate, I would love to hear from you. Um, I haven't found a method for doing it, for, for any of it. Um, installing WinClone. Um, I would go ahead and have WinClone prepped and on your system when you're getting ready, this being the computer that you've prepared your image on. Um, I've looked into, and I'm surprised no one's mentioned it yet, our system center, system center guys do all their update, maintenance, VMs. That's how they live and survive. Um, they've got tons of these. I have heartedly looked at ways that I could build, maintain, and create this Windows image in a VM and then get it over to the Mac side. Has anyone done anything like that? Because I would love to, to get info from you. What format? Huh? What format are they doing them in? So he uses VMware Workstation. Mm -hmm. um, he then uh, pixie boots into that you know, VM and he uses Ghost. He captures the image. So now it's in a Ghost format, right? So then I take that file, I take an external hard drive, image that drive with the Ghost image, and I connect that to the Deploy Studio and just capture what's on the external hard drive. And bam, I have my uh, Windows image. And see, the issue I've ran in with trying to do any type of VM is WinClone's very particular about it being its format. And for me to have the deployment of the Windows image from within the Mac OS, WinClone's the only tool I've found that could do it. Um, uh, at one time, was it NetRestore could do it four or five years ago, but now I think that's, I don't think it can still, since like Apple bought it. I said I, I used the Ghost to transfer Mac images before. It was pretty much like you said. Similar situation? I would, I would use a uh, uh, PE disk mm -hmm. on my Mac, and then I would image, and that would allow me to restore it. But you're, again, booting to something non-Mac yes. when you're doing, and that's I'm trying to keep it all within a Mac installer environment, and that's where I have the trouble is leaping from one to the other. Yes, sir? WinFone is just built on SCFS tools. It's an open source project. True. Actually doing it from within the VM, have them loaded. Because my. Uh, I'm just saying as a substitute, if you want to substitute for WinClone proper. Well, and I really got to looking at that when WinClone development had been dropped for that year period. It got me spooked, and that was the main reason I try not to rely on third-party tools. Right. Not that I don't like third-party stuff. I build a lot of my own, but you never know when Shvin's going to decide he doesn't want to support something again, and you're totally in a bad spot. Right. Um, right. Mm-hmm. So if at all possible, uh, back, I guess, from corporate days, I like to stick with a vendor's tool if possible, if it's not totally junk. Just that way I can go to them and go, hey, you said this would work. And again, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm sticking with Package Maker because I can at least call Apple and complain um, for now. I mean, granted, I've done Iceberg. I've used some of the other ones, but I just... I have not. I've re heard about that this week and, and started looking at it. Luggage session tomorrow. Probably. Luggage session? Are you plugging? Go ahead, get your plug in. <laughs> On luggage? Okay. And that's for package type deployment? It's for creating packages. It uses the package maker command line. Oh, okay. Okay. And you're creating main files to pull the resources together to send to package 
you're fully automating that in time. Good idea. Um, I'm sorry. I have not tested it. I've. I will know much in the next few weeks because, as well as boot camp being updated that I wasn't aware of, um, I was wanting to look at using the new version of WinClone to have it ready for when Mountain Lion comes. Because for me, Mountain Lion is going to drop at the totally wrong time of year to, for that to happen. Um, so I want to try to be prepared for that. And I've got to look at, I know I was looking at his site. He offers uh, site license pricing now, which he didn't when he was first releasing it. I think it's like $500 for a site, which is totally worth it for us for the number of deployments we're going to do. Um, I'm hoping he's kept those command line tools built into it. I would assume as much. I have a feeling the only tweaking he's done is like the same hacking I've done to make WinClone actually work on Windows. Um, give you an idea. It works on, excuse me. I said that wrong. WinClone work on Lion. Uh, WinClone GUI does not work on Lion, the donationware version. The new version that you can get through his website does. Mm -hmm. I've, hacked, yeah. Yeah. I've hacked the old donationware version to make it work on Lion for GUI because we have people who run diagnostics in a net boot who needed that. Uh, the command line stuff works fine. It, it needed no tweaks whatsoever. Um, it was just the gooey part that was crashing and burning. Um, here's just some cleanup stuff we do with WinClone. I found at least the older version, the donation where I don't know if the new one, uh, again, I haven't tested it, is good about it. But occasionally it's supposed to clean up the page file, but it didn't always do it. So I would usually manually go in and, and do it. And that's just a set of commands that will go in, mount, unmount the drive, uh, essentially replace the page file using the NTFS command set with a blank file uh, just to flush it. Because especially with the newer hardware, and you got eight gigs of RAM in the machine, you don't want to use it up eight gigs of hard drive for a page file just sitting there idle. Um, you don't want to clean that out. A um, few settings changes. I don't use the DMG format. Um, I let it keep with the older uh, IMG, um, which is actually gun zipped on top of that um, format. Just that t tends to keep the size down. I'm, I'm looking to shrink everything as much as possible. Um, and then, of course, we shrink the partition. That's a very important step. I should have it in bright red blinking lights. If you ever plan on doing the Windows imaging and you ever anticipate that you're going to need to put it on a different size partition, you're going to need to shrink it or you're going to go all the way back to square one. Um, what the shrinking does is it does a little check disk flag that tells Windows something altered you need to scan and check and it will then, no matter what size partition you put it on, it will fluff up to fill. Otherwise, you could make like a 40 gig partition, slap it in a 100 gig or a 40 gig image, slap it in a 100 gig, and it'll still only say it's 40. It'll never use that extra. But that, that's a very important little step that's not, jumps out at you. And then, of course, create the image after you've done that shrink procedure. Um, and all that does is squeeze it down to the smallest possible size. Um, were all you guys plan on being here for the second part? Yeah? Okay. Um, do you want me to just keep talking through, or do you want to take a few minutes to take a break, stretch your legs, go to the restroom, or? Break. Okay, we'll take a break for a few minutes and then we'll get into the fun torrent parts, which is I've made you drudge through all that Windows stuff for an hour. So, sorry, but it's a necessary evil for what you're doing. Uh, we had just finished preparing our, our Windows image, what we're actually wanting to, to deploy. Um, and granted, that takes a lot of prep time, but it's not that bad once you've done it the first time. You kind of get a routine of it. Um, Again, I would love to script some of that down, make it a little more easy, but a lot of it is just hand-holding because you're doing creature comfort things, updating software. It's just normal maintenance. If you have student employees, it might be a great time to give them something to do. Um, wish I had students. Um, anyway, uh, now we've went to the Mac side. Um, I just walked you through a little bit of the preparation of WinClone. Um, and the reason I walked you through some of that, that was using WinClone, and I'm just using the GUI there, but you could script that through some of their uh, automated scripts um, to actually create the image. Now that we have Windows prepared, it's ready for its first time deployment. It's been generalized, ready for the out-of-box uh, out experience. We just took WinClone, popped a few settings in, and have now made our WinClone image. And you wind up using those settings with a .img.gz, which is just the image format, and it's gun zipped. Um, we have toyed and tinkered with the possibility of not gun zipping it, um, thinking that would save us some time on the cloning. 
um, because it's not having to, to go through the uncompression stage. And in our testing, it really was a, a wash either way. The extra time we gain from not cloning, having to unzip and uncompress the clone is made up for now instead of a 10 gig image, I might have a 20 gig image. And networks already our issue with trying to deploy this to lots of machines at a time. So I don't want to increase that network file size, if at all possible. Um, so now we've got our boot.img.gz. That's what the name of the, the default file is. Um, we generally at this point would go ahead and run it through Vuse, which is a Mac um, piece of software. Um, reason we chose this specifically, it's is one of the few, if only, pieces of Mac software that I found could create a four gig piece. Um, anybody in here not familiar with how torrents actually work and function behind the scenes? I wish there was some way I could show you some magical, beautiful, look, it's a pretty torrent running, but it's more a thing in your head of, of how it works. Um, do I need to, can I skip, or do you want a little bit of an explanation? Sorry. Okay. Um, when the torrent runs, you're taking a large file and it breaks it into pieces. Um, and then it's almost like you have pieces A, B, C, D, if you think about it, on down. I can then, I am the server. I hold all the pieces. He contacts me and says, hey, I want some of that. I give him piece A. You contact me. I give you piece B. I give you piece C. I give him piece D. Now, you can trade. In fact, I do a cool thing at career day at my kids' school. I give them pieces of candy and let them create copies and share and distribute and show them the difference between a one-to-one -one where they have to wait in line for web or them get the pieces and then they all stand there sharing pieces. And it's a hundred times faster when they do it, especially the more pieces of candy you have, the faster it goes. I should have brought candy and I could have had you guys stand up and do that too. But now you can trade A and B for him and C and A with them and, and you can create these copies on the fly. You don't have to talk to the server anymore. Each of you have all the pieces to make the whole. You share the pieces and now everybody has a copy, okay? It may only be a little bit faster with four pieces, but imagine if you have a hundred. Now, if you're all standing in line a hundred people deep and I can only give you one piece at a time, it's gonna take forever. But if I give you a piece and we go from one to a hundred and then as you guys are out of line, you're sharing pieces with each other, you'll get those hundred pieces distributed in, in a very short period of time. That's the whole concept and the basis of the torrent, is you're busting that into many, many pieces and letting the clients fight over the pieces and share them. Um, and there's other benefits to it as well I'll go to in a moment. Yes, sir. Yeah, you have to think of the topology impact of that as a benefit. It's because if he's getting chunk A from you, he's going over a link to the server, which might go out True. to VLAN or whatever. And then when I connect and I get piece A from him, I can do so locally. So exactly. In environment, it slowly transfers the, the bandwidth hit mm -hmm. from going out of your lab to all being internal. Exactly. And I got some graphs. I'm going to show the, the differences in that. By rarity. If he's the only True. guy that has A, he'll start feeding that to other people so it gets the ball. Exactly. Like that. that way, the more rare a piece is, the quicker it'll try to get that copy out so that everything. It's almost like there's a little bit of ramp up time and then a peak. And then it kind of trickles back down at the tail end as people are getting the last few pieces. Um, other benefits, we'll talk about more. Um, each piece is checksummed so that there's security there. We know something hasn't gotten garbled. If you give him piece B and you go, you know, this piece B doesn't look right, something, you just throw it away and send me piece B again or maybe get it from you instead of him. And that way you get stability, consistency in those pieces. Um, you know they're secure. You know they're going to fit back together. Um, you're right, the load dispersal, not just server load, and, and I'll show more of that in a moment, um, but traffic mode. Um, like you mentioned, the, the big bottleneck for us in particular was we have 100, 200 students physically in one location. Our bottleneck's the link going out of the building. Um, we have redundant one gig links, so two gig uplink is our max. I could peg the server out with a 10 gig or fiber or whatever, doesn't matter. It's the building that we're going to choke. And not just choke each other, but we choke the building. The faculty and staff in there just don't know what's going on for those two hours because everything just locks down on them. Uh, it's kind of like here yesterday with the wireless. Um, so, uh, in, in particular, the reason I wanted to point out why we use this was the four meg pieces. The concept of the torrent being a way to massively distribute large files over a slower 
network connection being the internet. Um, when Bram, what's his name? I forget his last name. The guy who came up with the concept. It was figuring different people with different connection speeds. At home, I might have 12 megabit. Somebody else might have six. Somebody might be lucky and have 30. Somebody might still be on a phone modem. Yes, those still exist. Um, so you don't know the speed connections. And on the internet, there's a, a balance of returns. You would think the more pieces, the better, but not necessarily to a certain point. Um, around 2,000 is the max you would want to get piecewise because then it becomes extra. It's kind of like walking and chewing bubblegum at the same time. The torrent software is trying to keep track of that and it has more to, to handle. But at the same time, to break it into bigger pieces means there's more traffic that has to travel. And if you're over internet speeds, that's not necessarily good because you might get 500 kilobytes of a one meg file and then your connection or they flake or drop or lose their wireless. Well, now you got to scrap that and start over. So you get a lot of resending information, almost like, um, what am I thinking of a network, uh, collision traffic in a way because people are having to resend. Also, every piece is going to have to have a little bit of extra overhead that checks some information. Almost like uh, if you think of TCP network traffic, you're going to have header info in there that tells that data where to go. So the smaller those packets, the less actual data is contained in the packet and a lot of header. So you're trying to strike a balance there. Um, for us, we're not dealing with internet. We're not dealing with the slow connection. We're on a gig network. We've got full bandwidth. So for us, speed is, is there. Packet size should not be a problem. We, we can go up to as large as you know, we want. I would love to be able to break the pieces into like 32 meg pieces because for us, 32 meg chunk over gigabits a second. I mean, it, it should all get there. Um, four meg is the largest I could find any piece of software make the pieces of the torrent when it busts that thing apart. Um, most of them only go up to about one or two megs. For me, it, it was actually a benefit. Every bit I could get to a larger piece, those are just bigger chunks that are passed instead of lots of teeny pieces with lots of overhead. Helps us really tweak the speed out of it. Um, and we just use the views when we set it up, we're creating it as a private tracker um, and set in the announce URL that's incorporated in the torrent file that basically tells the clients, here's who you talk to to know who to get pieces from. Because you're not getting the piece from the server necessarily, but the server's controlling who has the pieces, they communicate and the, the, that's the tracker. And it keeps track of all the pieces and says, okay, you need to talk to machine number three, he's got the piece you need. You need to talk to machine number five. And, it, and then the, the actual heavy data is done between the clients. Very, very low um, overhead for the server to handle the communication because it's very small bits of information it's handling. There's a question? In the, yes. What software are you using for the actual private tracker? We'll get to that in just a moment. Why did you choose views over like MicroTorrent? Uh, use views specifically for the four meg pieces. That was, will it do? I believe MicroTorrent because. Will it do larger than four? Because I'll change. Right, my completely legal private trackers do 15 meg chunks, and their recommended BitTorrent client is uh, MicroTorrent. So Here's my card. Contact me with that info. I would love to. Anything I can do to tweak this even faster, better. Um, the last time I looked at it was three years ago. So. Oh, yeah, it's definitely okay, so um, it's one of those deals where once you get it working, it's not broke. Why fix it? And I haven't went back and, and reevaluated increases in technology. But when I was researching and trying to find information, and I could find nothing t that even talked about more than two and four meg file size and, and even then it was people illegally pushing movies, uh, especially HD, 8 gig, you know, um, high def files. And that was about the closest synonymous type information I could find that related to this. The other issue we've had is our image has grown from around 3 gigs with XP up to we're around 10 now with Windows 7 just due to the nature of the beast and every time... I install Windows updates and the thing shrinks and then sometimes it grows and I just don't know. But anyway, but yes, I would love to, to change those. If those pieces could be a little larger because I'm actually a little over 2,000 pieces now and I know that's around the cusp. So anything, about a thousand is the, the, the butter zone. That's, that's where you really want to get in that, that golden spot. Um, any less than that, you're kind of killing yourself with, you know, um, you might lose more, any more than you've got too much overhead for the tracker to keep track of. Yes? Yeah, I was going to ask, um, I guess, did you have to you know, work with your networking team in regards to this? Uh, 
that is actually, I am in a very unique position and I never realized how lucky I was till I came to this conference and just on and off conversations with people at lunch and at the gathering last night, realized we are in a very open network. Um, and I'm getting the vibe from other people, that's a rarity. Our network guys are very laid back and we're, we, they don't block anything. Um, now, internal. Our firewall on the outside, you got boiling oil and arrows and everything, They're, you're not getting in um, without VPN access. But internally, we have so much research faculty that are doing God knows what on our network. Um, we try not to limit and block. That being said, there are some things. Uh, for instance, we block iTunes, music sharing, AirPlay, stuff like that over our Wi-Fi because it'll cripple the Wi-Fi network. Um, we do have throttling and um, uh, network shaping where like back in the Napster days and that was crippling the network, we could funnel that down between eight and five weekdays to where it's such a trickle it's not even useful. But after that, we don't care what you do. Um, we don't want to play policeman is what it basically comes down to. Um, and I've been very lucky because when I contacted our network people, hey, I'm thinking of doing this. What are we going to need? And they're like, let us know how it works. We'd love to, to see it. You know, it's, um, if anything, they're more curious about it than I am to see how it impacts. Because it, it, honestly, it lightens their burden. Um, and I'll show some more about that, about how the difference, it, it, it moves that, the same amount of data is getting passed around and changed, but it changes where and how it's flowing and making it a more local which where you can really handle that, that load. Yes. Because uh, of the like, Higher Education Opportunity Act of 2008, you know, universities are all required to monitor for file sharing and mm -hmm. respond to the MCA requests like, right away. Mm -hmm. uh, we send out letters too. Yeah. Is, so we we implemented a, an appliance that is quite phenomenal in what it can do, but like it doesn't just monitor protocol, but also the content that's going over the protocol. Mm -hmm. but, No, it's internal only. We're, we're really not concerned with what's going on internal. Unless, I mean, if we've got spot spam and, you know, that's different. Unless but Unless you're at hitting outside and passing that firewall. And we have the same thing, intrusion detection. Our security team has got tons of monitoring. We're running trend where it blocks websites and ads. And, I mean, we're, we're very diligent when it comes to getting out. But if you're in our campus, we trust you. To a degree. Um, because to even get on our network, I mean, we even have network registrations where you have to register that MAC address to your name, and there's so much of a rigmarole we have to go through to even get on the network. Once you've passed enough credence there, we just kind of say, okay, do what you need to do. Now, once you leave campus, you're going to go through the same filter. Now, if I was trying to do this off, yeah, it would it'd never fly. But because it's all internal traffic, and purposely, not just so I get past security, but due to licensing and regulations, I mean, think about it. I'm taking Windows operating system, throwing it out there. I mean, yeah, with Office installed and, you know, I'm just here, there's the pieces, enjoy. Yes, packets, love it, download what you want. We've got to have some semblance. If they say, hey, we caught wind, you're just throwing this stuff out. It, it, if you got a copy of my installer, I could give it to you today, it's not going to work. You, you got to be on our network. Um, not on, uh, multiple layers of being on our network. Um, you're not going to be able to even run the ins main installer package because it can't talk to my server to even get the package if I gave you the link. Um, if you get the package, it's not going to be able to get the other pieces it needs to engage from my server. You try to crank up the torrent, it's not going to work for you either because it's a private torrent, only works internal with only DNS recognition internal. So, um, yeah, I mean, you can give this to people in China, they're not going to be able to use it. So, and that's just for us to say, to a vendor, hey, we've done as much as we can to make it. Now, if they throw it on a disk and give it to somebody, you know, the full copy to files, there's nothing you can do to protect against that. Um, bad guys will be bad guys. So. Um, but anyway, that was Boost in a nutshell. Um, and I will definitely look into that other one to make bigger pieces in the future. <sighs> package Maker. I like Package Maker. And I know most people don't. I also hate it. It's a love-hate relationship. Um, the things I do like about it, though, mostly, uh, it's very familiar deployment. Again, it's what everybody sees in the Apple stuff. Um, 
I can now do this as a small PKG. It saves a couple of layers for the user. They don't have to understand, oh, I gotta download the DMG and then mount the image and then, oh look, I've got Skype running and it's from the DMG and I didn't copy it to applications. And, you know, the, Especially new Mac users, they don't necessarily get that concept. I can now wrap that as a straight PKG file on a website and tell the students, hey, you see, the, go to this website, click that link. Now, sit back and relax. And it just straight comes down and downloads. Um, you do have the extra step in line where you have to engage it, but in previous OSs, it would just start running automatically. Um, there's some, yes? I just, just another plug for Reichman. Yeah. Uh, about the luggage and how it uses the command line of package maker. Mm -hmm. um, with him being a coworker, I've just recently started using the luggage, and it's amazing how simple you can make packages now. Like one of the really cool things is you can every time you make a package, it automatically like adds our custom RIT background to the packages and everything hmm. like that. So, you know, similarly, you can do it all through GUI as well. But right. Similarly, uh, that way, when the students are downloading packages off your website, you know, when it's got that background, it kind of gives them a little more of a trust mm -hmm. that. It, yeah, this is authentic. Right. This is this is really, and I have to show you it has a pretty tiger paw oh. up in it. Um, and not only that, I'm curious with luggage. Can you set stuff like the system requirements? Because Package Maker does that through Java, where you can have it checked to make sure your certain operating system level, certain processor type, um, various system checks. And that's another thing I use built in, just to idiot proof stuff. You never know when somebody's going to come in with a. PowerBook running Tiger and want to try to throw Windows on it, and I can just stop them right at the door. You're not at the right processor. You're not, you know, just go away. It's um, my understanding that the Package Maker GUI is just that—it's a GUI for the command line utility that Apple has created. Okay. Um, so there are still commands. See, I haven't went down to the level of automating the uh, the actual package building. I'm considering doing it, but right now I'm still tweaking stuff within the GUI portions to get it the way I want it. Um, Really, there's very little in this. It's more or less just here's a, a collection of scripts, dump it in a temp directory, post script that says go run this stuff. That's all I'm using Package Maker here. Where I go in more in depth is with our Mac software installer, where I've got a dozen, 20 pieces of software, and not only do I want them installed, but they've got to have license, registration keys, put in plist files. Um, I want to make sure, oh, they didn't download the newest version of Firefox, which came out this afternoon. Um, and, and do comparison checks there. And most of my power comes from the postscripts anyway. Package Maker is more just the delivery mechanism. Here's all the pieces, put them in there. I do all the magic with the back end with the scripting. And that's where I can really take control of what's going on and idiot proof as much as possible. Um, check system requirements, talked about that. Can provide choices. We have an extra little thing in this particular one where one size does not fit all. Um, I might have a nursing student who needs to run one little piece of software in Windows, and that's the sole reason she's got uh, Windows installed. Then I got an engineering major who's going to spend at least half their time in Windows for some of the stuff in their program. And engineering's requested that they split the hard drive at least 50-50, which on the new 750 gig and terabyte hard drives is 500 gigs. So there's, there's a huge discrepancy. We added the ability as just a little extra script. If they want something besides the default, which we do at about 50 gigs, I believe, um, gives you enough room for Windows and a little room for some extra programs. But if you're going to have to put AutoCAD and SolidWorks and a lot of these engineering pieces of software, you're going to need more space. They can just pick that in the installer again. So it's, and we have a choice between like 30 gigs up to 500, and they just pick the size that best suits them. Most users have no clue what I'm talking about and no concept. And so uh, we just kind of break them down by category. If you're an engineer, do this. If you're anything else, just go with the default and leave it like that. Um, and can customize the setup, like you were talking about with backgrounds and things of that nature. Make it, I've got tons of info in there with you know, the readme that nobody ever reads about when you should and should not do and, and try things and how to get through the dual boot, uh, the rebooting holding option. But as I said, nobody uses it. Um, here's the GUI part for Package Maker. And like I said, this is a very simple package. Um, if you notice, there's only, I've got a separate piece for the choose partition size that runs as a script if you choose it in the customize section. Um, and then iHook, which is for my feedback mechanism. Um, feedback's good. You gotta let the user know what's going on or else they think everything, They worst case scenario, it froze on them. And then of course, there's just a, a clumping of actual scripts um, and this actually includes, uh, the top portion of that is the 
wing clone command line pieces that it needs to be able to function, which is called by a separate script, which is what I've got posted online. Um, and if you notice, there's a couple pieces in there, the BTCLI and BTPD. Those are the actual BitTorrent local client pieces, command line that are incorporated. Obviously, I'm not going to want to use a GUI torrent client built into the installer. This should all be happening behind the scenes. Um, the reason we like that particular version, it runs as a process daemon in the background. So as they run this installer, it engages the BitTorrent locally on their machine at the very first stage and step and says, hey, I'm here. I need pieces. I need to download. Give me something. Anybody? Hello? Bueller? Are you out there? Um, and the other pieces, like I said, there's the actual wing clone and, and some other stuff I have in there that engage. I even have a portion in there that gives me reporting back. So I know when people run it, what version they ran. It gives me feedback so I know when there's issues, problems. I don't have this one giving me when there's errors because there's actually very little, but like with our wireless installer, I have it feedback every time somebody runs it and it has an error. That way I can go, oh, I'm getting a lot of such and such error. We've got a bug in the problem. Just not being a stalker, just trying to get feedback so that I know head off problems before they hit me. I look smarter when I go, yeah, I know about that. So. Or I've actually had people call and go, yeah, I'm trying to run the installer. I'm like, yeah, on a Mac Mini? And they're like, yeah. And scare alert, scare them big time. Um, and of course, like I said, it all engages and kicks off by a post install script, which actually engages iHook, which then takes over and runs the rest. Again, I've got iHook getting in the middle there as the feedback mechanism. It's actually controlling and talking back to the main installer. So if there's a problem, it can tell the installer program. At the same time, it can handle what's happening with the actual installation. It's the intermediary there and give, provide user feedback at the same time. Um, the main installer script has three primary duties. And if you think about this, this was the simple part. It only took a few days to work out. You got to download the image. We got to get the image on the machine. You got to partition the drive. We got to have a place to put it. And we got to actually clone, put the image in that partition. That's all it does. It's, it's very simple, very, uh, three steps. <clears throat> Excuse me a moment. We actually did these in a different order the first year. Due to the size of hard drives back then, MacBooks were shipping with 60 and 80 gig hard drives. And we were trying to do 20 gig XP partitions. There were instances where people would have so much stuff already on their computer that if we downloaded the image first, you wouldn't have enough free space to be able to do the partitioning. So we had partitioning happening first. The downside to that, people would immediately, when they were in the installer, it would start slicing and dicing their hard drive. Then it would hit the download portion and choke for some reason. They were trying to run it over Wi-Fi like an idiot. Um, there was a hiccup in the network. Stars and moons weren't in the right place. For whatever reason, downloading died. You've already partitioned their drive, so now you've left them in an odd state of partitioning's happening, but nothing's there. It says there's windows, but it won't boot, and, no, and the installer erred, and I don't know how to fix it and undo it, and so people were having to come, and we were having to manually touch every machine that was getting botched, undo the partitioning. They couldn't even just, and, and sometimes they would just, well, let's just run it again, and then it would do it, and da 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 and you're getting, yeah, weirdness ensued. So quickly, we, once drives got big enough, and we figured there was enough space to actually house the image locally and be able to, uh, to do the partitioning, which we still have people. I mean, now you're talking about people wanting to do 500 gig partitions. And as a rule, the way disk util, we're actually just using command line there to do the, the partitioning. It's a good safe bet. If you want a 40 gig partition, you need 80 gigs of free space. You need about double of free space of whatever partition size. The system's got to move files. It all has to be contiguous on the, on the and you're going to get uh, partitioning errors if you don't have enough free space. Or if there's damage to the hard drive. Or if a file's corrupt and won't let it be moved. I mean, there's a few things where partitioning can die. And, and it happens. Not often, but occasionally. Um, oddly enough, there's a, and this is, I don't have this in the thing, but you might want to be aware of it. We have a rare glitch that happens about 1 in 50 installs. I can't fix it. I've given up hope. Um, it's like a glitch in the partition map. 
And when partitioning a, the machine, you could use it for years and never know there was a problem until you attempt to repartition drives. And it can't do it. There's just a glitch in the partition map. It, it can't rewrite that when it gets there. If you net boot to something else and run Disk Warrior, it'll go in, fix a little problem, do a little cleanup. Everything's great then. You can then repartition all day long. It'll fix the problem. I've had this happen with Macs fresh out of a box, brand new from the factory. I don't know if it's a glitch in Apple's factory making or something with the hard drives. Never narrowed it down, but about 150, it will just bail, and the only fix I found is Disk Warrior. Unfortunately, that being a third-party software, and you've got to boot to something else to do it, I can't roll any kind of fixing in the installer or even checking. I've not even found a way to know you're going to have that problem until it happens. But I've seen that as well. But mm -hmm. for me, just a standard FSCK single user mode fix it. So it's probably not. It may be a different machine, but yeah, I think file system. And I think what Disk Warrior might be doing a file systems check as part of its rewriting to the um, file database structure. But the uh, unfortunately, again, there's no way I can roll that into an installer as a fix. It's kind of, oh yeah, that happens, come on down, we'll 10 minutes run this, it fixes it, now I'll try it again and it'll, it'll work. Um, we even actually do that in the uh, workshops, so if a student has it happen, We've well, only lost about 10 minutes download time because it bails immediately in partitioning. Let's do that fix real quick. You're just behind the rest, but we'll still get you through it. Um, that website at the bottom there, Big Mac on Campus, uh, at WordPress.com, I've got a little article there with the main installer script. I wasn't going to go through every step in it. It has lots of error checking, making sure things are okay, that the environment's all right before it begins, that you've got enough free space, um, that you did, it initiates the downloading of the image file, um, as well as handles the cloning. So um, you might, again, I go through it, test, test, test on other stuff, um, but you would need to modify certain portions of that. For instance, where you're gonna house your image file, what web server, or what torrent tracker if you, if you do it that way. Um, a little more deeper into each of those. The download portion, uh, uh, we have it engaging BitTorrent um, after it gets through the system checks. Um, and that just cranks up the BitTorrent process daemon. It goes out and contacts the tractor, says, hey, I'm here, send me some pieces. Um, tell me who to get the pieces from. This continues to run in the background while it's engaging pieces and sharing with the client. Um, again, the beauty of this is it is secure. It's checksumming each piece. Um, a specific reason why we went with BTPD. First, it was command line tool, but there's more than one. Um, it has a unique ability when you're first creating your file that it doesn't... Any other BitTorrent client I found, if I want to download, when it, you first engage and say, hey, I want to get this file, it talks to the tracker and says, okay, how big is the file? And the tracker says, it's 10 gigs. Wait a minute, let me make 10 gigs of space. And it sits there and it writes out a 10 gig file. I'm guessing all zeros because there's no data yet, but it, it's marking off the hard drive. That takes about five minutes just for it to make an empty file at the initiation of the torrent. Um, if you're dealing with smaller files, it's negligible. You don't notice this sort of thing, and most torrent clients do it. They go ahead and, okay, here's my file. Now give me the stuff to put inside the file. It's, it's basically making a bucket the size it needs to be. Then as the torrent pieces come down, that's piece one. That's piece 1003. That's piece 92. And it puts them in the proper, almost like you're doing a, a block copy of imaging and cloning. It's putting the pieces in the right part. But it has to do that initiation of making, and we were losing five minutes. Every minute counts. And if the image file grows, that time grows as well. BTPD was the only one, and I don't know why, but it has a unique nature of growing the file as it gets pieces. I don't know, but I, I'm assuming it's getting pieces and just rearranging as necessary. Almost like if you had a deck of cards and you were putting them in the proper slots, and it, but it, it's faster, just based on that sheer principle alone. Because we gain five minutes right out of the chute that we're not sitting there waiting for an empty file to write before it even gets the first piece. So that's specifically why we chose that particular product. Um, as an after, oh, leftover, um, because we did originally have this built as just direct web download, the installer mechanism was the same, download, partition, clone. The difference the first couple years we did it was we just had it curl straight to a web address and, and grab the file. 
Um, but of course, everybody's banging heads against one another trying to get to that same file. We left that portion in the installer as a backup plan. So, if for some reason my tracker server will go blinks out, or my server crashes, or there's a hiccup in the network, and the, the, for some reason the torrent bails, which it's actually a lot more resistant to network fluxes than a direct web download. But for the sake of argument, if something went bad, it will give up on the torrent, scrap that, and then go back to the fallback as a direct web download. Um, almost like if you picture multicasting in labs, and if you have one and it loses it or loses it so many times, it'll just kick to a direct web download. Just as, okay, if not, nothing else works, do this. Might be a little slower, but we'll do it. Um, another benefit of leaving the web download in there as a backup is it gives me server-side control of the torrent. Since I'm running the tracker that controls the pieces and where they go from the same server, in workshops where I've got hundreds of people all trying to run this installer simultaneously, I want to run the tracker. I want to run the torrent. That's my biggest benefit. But the other nine months of the year, it's actually a downside. The download time for a web direct, if you're the only individual, is about four or five minutes. So running the torrent takes eight to 10. In my situation, though, that's consistent, so that's a benefit. But at nine months of the year, I don't have hundreds of people hitting my server. I have a guy here, and somebody an hour later, and somebody at 2 a.m. on a Saturday night. Why, I don't know, but they do. Um, all you know, running this installer, so it's hit and miss. I can handle up to a dozen without any overlap of bandwidth. I generally shut the torrent part off nine months of the year because it actually lengthens the install for the user and there's no benefit for me running the torrent those nine months. I, I get nothing back for that and it costs them five minutes of their life when they could be doing whatever. Um, and of course provides the feedback. I have it talking to iHook consistently, showing the user progress, what's going on. Um, and I'll talk about some things I'm wanting to do in the future and how we might change that in a moment. Um, second part is if you picked a particular partition size you wanted, when we hit the partitioning stage, it goes ahead and uses that um, partition size. It goes through the partitioning stage. You get very little user feedback here because of the nature of it sectioning the hard drive. It pretty well locks down the operating system for three to five minutes while it's doing that procedure. That's just the nature. I mean, you, if you've ever repartitioned with Disk Util, you know it's, you don't want to be doing things to files while it's trying to partition the drive anyway. So that's a good thing. Here's where we have to start accounting for the differences in <clears throat> operating system versions. As you're all aware, with the advent of Lion, you now have a new partition that's hidden in there called Recovery, which I'm sure has given everybody a little bit of a headache if you're into this line of work. Um, we had to add uh, difference from Leopard and Snow Leopard, just take into account, okay, what are we dealing with here? Where are we going to put the Windows partition? Is it going to be partition three? Is it going to be partition four? We need to know what beast we're dealing with here so that we know where to properly. I don't want to clone the image to the wrong partition. That would be bad. So we just have to account for that. And the last part is, of course, engaging the cloning. Um, the actual cloning is being done by WinClone command line. Um, the normal set of defaults works great for Leopard and Snow Leopard. Um, with Lion, again, we have to account. Not only do we know, have to know where to make the partition, we need to now know which partition to stick the cloning part on. And there's actually a separate way you can do the wing clone command that designates specifically which partition in there. Just a little if, hey, check here, check this. If not this, do this and, and have it do whichever command. They don't run this. If they have already done something like that, they're knowledgeable enough to go. And they, odds are they probably already got Windows in there as a boot camp, or they're a Linux geek and they're doing stuff there. If that's the case, then no, they don't. And we have warnings. Big, do not do you know on the main screen. If you already, and to be honest, it will fail. I have checks in the installer that test before it even does anything. How many partitions you got? What's going you know to to analyze the situation, and it will fail before you even begin saying, nope, you, you're not ready for this. This is not, this machine's not in the original state of partitioning to be able to do that. Um, so it will bail out on them, Sp specifically so somebody doesn't botch an install like that or mess up something they already had in there. And of course, provides the feedback. Um, God, that's a lot of code. 
The main things here I just wanted to illustrate, there were a few modifications we've had to make over the years. Um, the actual winclone.pearl, which is the main script within winclone that does the cloning portion. Um, we made some modifications to it that allows us the first one there, and I've highlighted in orange the part we changed. That's just, this is the actual command. Um, and you guys, if you know Perl, can probably just read right through it. This is actually doing the cloning portion where it's copying in. We're just redirecting output into a, a text file so that the iHook can monitor the situation to know what's happening so that it, it, it completes the loop so one piece can talk to another. Um, when clone was luckily already built in with outputting what percentage it was as it's going through the process. So we're just tacked into that. So I can then feed that into a nice pretty gooey thing for the user saying, your cloning is 2% done. It is 3% as it progresses along. So that's just tracking what's going on with that. <clears throat> the second flag, and this is a very interesting piece. <clears throat> we just added that this past year because for two years, we'd been plagued with an issue Similar to the partition map glitch that the file system check fixes, one in 50 machines, we had another random one in 40, one in 50 the first year, then about one in 20, one in 30 the second year, and then it got to be about one in five, one in four, one in three the last year. It was becoming more and more of an issue as time went on where people would do this, the installer would complete, everything was great, says it finished, wonderful, there's a partition, says Windows, you open it, there's files, you go to startup panel, look, Windows, I can boot, great. You reboot, hold the option key, there's no Windows choice at the bootloader. If you forcibly tried to make it by going through the startup panel, it would try, but it would give you a disk, it couldn't, it wouldn't boot. And you didn't know this was a problem until you've went through an hour install and just kind of flip a coin and see who the lucky people were that day. And it would just, it didn't work. The fix, and it was a known issue when checking with Apple, and their fix was wipe it out and try again. I give it to them, that usually worked. Every now and then you'd have poor, some poor unlucky soul that it took two, three, maybe four tries. It would eventually work, but it was still a headache and a nightmare. What I think caused the problem, and since the problem has went away, I'm pretty sure this was it, there's a stage at the tail end of WinClone. Uh, again, this is the donationware 2.2 version. I'm not sure if this still exists in the new one. I'll find out soon when I'm doing some testing. That as the architecture and the machines got faster and faster, I think it made this problem occur more and more often, which is why it grew in number from one in 50 to one in 20 to one in, and, and it was becoming a major headache. Due to the nature of how Windows, uh, it, it's doing an artificial master boot record um, at the EFI. Because uh, EFI that Apple is using is not really EFI, it's Apple's flavor of EFI. They've, they've, so you can't modify. So even, I think Windows 7 can actually do EFI boots, but not an Apple EFI boot, which is why it's, they're still doing the artificial master boot record method. Um, there's a flag in, in part of the WinClone where it actually goes in and writes a few bytes at this artificial master boot record place. So when you hit the bootloader and it goes, oh yeah, I can do Mac or Windows, you do Windows, Windows goes, oh, where's the master boot record? And well, there it is in the EFI layer. What was happening was two different things are happening in a WinClone and one got ahead of the other and the install and the cloning was finishing, but it wasn't completing the master boot record right in time. And so it wasn't happening. And again, it kind of mattered as to if your machine was faster or slower than somebody else's or if your machine was busy and they were surfing Facebook at the same time as the installer. Because this could actually run in the background while they're doing stuff on a website. Basically, if the machine was too busy or not, one step would get ahead of it and, and you end up with that screwed up method of now it won't boot because there's no master boot record. Everything's there. The data's there. The partition's there. The files are there but there's no master boot record entry, so you can never boot to it. And you have to just wipe it out and start all over. Um, actually, after I figured out what the problem was, I could have made a tool that would fix that glitch after the fact, but it was easier to just fix it at the source. So um, just be aware, we added a, essentially what this is, is just a tag file. So after that master boot record write is done, we have the main script wait until it writes that file saying, yes, it finished, now you can go. Otherwise, the main script just sits there and waits 
until that trigger finally hits, and then it'll go on. One step was getting ahead of the other was the problem. It was a timing issue. Um, web server, not going to go into a lot of detail. We're just standard X serve. Um, we're using Apache internal use. That was mainly for the package deployment. We just house a, a box. I like to do it on Apple. Just I've spent too many years doing multiple platforms and different things. I like to keep everything one as best I can. You have a lot less problems that way. Um, the torrent server, we actually happen to be running that on the same X serve. Um, we just have MAP put in with it. And the tracker we're using is called Rivet Tracker. Um, free open source tracker. Um, we do have it set up internal only, as we talked about. And I'm actually running at least one primary seed off that same server. Um, we're using C torrent. A uh, reason for that one in particular was it was easy to script, simple to use. Um, Oh, another benefit I forgot to mention, uh, the BTPD. Not only was it good at writing the file, but it has an, a very interesting feedback with upload and downloads built into the, um, the executable as it's running. So you can keep pulling that to get information, to, to get that feedback of what's your upload rate, what's your download rate, what percentage are we done with getting the files and the pieces. And, and that gave us a nice ability command line to get feedback that we could then display for the user. Um, none of the other trackers, I mean, some of them could do it to different degrees, but I really like just the method and the format that this one gave that data back to you. It was easy to parse out and switch it into a nice pretty GUI. Uh, for people. A C torrent's just down and dirty, really clean, easy. You can make a set of scripts, put it on a box or the server. Um, the tracker really is very low overhead. You'd think with all the communication that's going on between the tracker server and all the clients that there's going to be a lot, but it's really a blip on the radar. I mean, it's, you're dealing with kilobytes of information when I'm talking about gigabytes of, of pieces and, and things. So it's, it's very small by comparison. Um, we can actually compare and I don't have any data for this, but I can get a feed off the C-Torrent seed to see how much data it's pushing out from that seed. And you can compare that against the tracker's information to get an idea of what's the total traffic and how much traffic's coming from my server. And just compare and contrast those two. Yes? I assume when you do that deployment with your you know, 100 people in the room, you will bring a machine that's already got the torrent locally. So <sighs> we've, we've done it and not done it. And there's been very little difference, with an exception. Um, as a rule, yes, it's not a bad idea. Just, you never know. The network to the building went kaboom. Um, now granted, well, I guess if that happened, then we, we've lost communication with the tracker, so the whole torrent's going to die anyway. You, you've got to have at least a feed out to the main tracker server. As far as lightning load, we even talked about, well, maybe we should bring two or three machines, and that way, locally, we've got lots of seats. Since that original seed can get the pieces dispersed within a matter of 30 seconds, once you've got to pass that 30 second window, you don't even really need a seed locally. Those machines can work it out amongst themselves. Um, we do usually have one running local, just it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. Now, there is a unique situation we get into where this has happened to us twice in two different buildings. At our main support center, where we get the main flood of students, thousands in line, that first move in weekend to campus. You know, and everybody's running around, their hair's on fire, and, and students are in line everywhere. At our main area, the network just it gets congested. We've got people doing AutoCAD, SolidWorks, geez, giant 10 gig installs off of network volumes, because they don't have any of our Windows stuff automated like this. And they've asked me, no, I don't do Windows. Um, so they're all feeding out of our pipe. So us trying to also run boot camp installs is just more congestion. When we get in that situation, it is hugely important to have an internal seed because then that lightens the burden. If it were, our pipes completely clogged data trying to get in and out of that building, but we can at least still get tracker information in and out, then the seed can run and locally, I'll run a seed in my office and maybe a coworker might run one under his desk or off his main laptop just to have a little extra. So that way you're not bottlenecked trying to get in and out of the building. Because we've seen it clog the whole torrent down because it can't get out of the building. But when you do that and it's running local, all you've got to really get out of the building. And we'll even kill the seed on the server, the main server, because most of the installs are happening there. That's a unique though, because then we're in an uber overload situation of not just me running hundreds of installs, but additionally other hundreds of installs are running with these giant pieces of software where we do flood the, the pipe. 
I've, I've allevi alleviated that for our workshops because we're in a separate building when we do them and we never hit flooding the pipe when we're running the torrent. But when we add that additional traffic, we do. So yes, I do run seeds. And we'll, we'll, I had a thing in there about that later too. Um, that you really, you want to think about how, like you mentioned, to topography of your network and where you're, what's going on behind the scenes. And it really makes you realize when and where you need to have things like another seed running uh, locally or not. Uh, one seed's enough though, I mean, to be honest. The speeds we're dealing with, I know out on the internet, the more seeds the better, because now you've got lots of places. We're on such high fast network speeds that even one seed's enough to, to propagate everything quickly. Um, your limitation here, our bottleneck, is hard drive read and write speed. Once you hit 30, 40 megs on laptops, maybe 60 megs a second for the 7200 RPM drives, you've, you've flooded your machine. It can do no more. And that's what we generally hit with the, the um, this is Rivet Tracker. Uh, just it's web-based, little GUI app. Um, some of the things I might switch it. Uh, we haven't tested it in a while, but we weren't completely happy with it. I mean, it was nice. It was easy to use as far as adding the torrent in, and it'll show you, you know, how many completed downloads, how many traffic. You notice we're actually we ended up over about 14 terabytes that summer um, of data. But I noticed things like the leachers. We we didn't have four million leachers, um, and the speed is doing a calculation 24 hours a day. So there's times when nothing's running, so that changes our throughput. So I'm not getting good data, data back from that. Um, but I, I can at least gauge, so say this server pushed nearly 12, t or excuse me, this torrent controlled the interaction of 12 terabytes of data through these sessions. Then I can compare that to ctorrent and say, oh look, the server actually only pushed two terabytes of data in that same period of time. So I know I actually, from my server, only did two terabytes. The other 10 terabytes was local, and it never left that room, or never left that building, rather, which makes our network guys happy, because now I haven't pushed 10 terabytes of traffic out and in of a building and through and across campus into the data center that's 15 miles away in the next town, and I've kept it all right here on one switch. And, and the switch backbones, depending on the building, are 32 or 64 megabit or gigabit. So yeah, I think this one's 64, and I know we've never come close to maxing out the, the bandwidth of the switch itself within the building or the traffic going out of the um, building when we're running the torrent. Um, and we just talked about C torrent flexibility, turning seeds on and off. Um, can run multiple seeds as many as you want, and the seed strategy of where and when I might want to have one engaged. Um, and at what building, uh, depending on where the load is. Um, here's our website page, and notice we have various automated installers that do different things, and this is what the student would see. They would just go to the page, say Windows, click Download Installer, and has a nice background, and again, just straight package maker installation, give them lots of information, uh, don't even think about doing it over wireless, people still do it over wireless. Um, it actually works better over wireless as a torrent than uh, direct web download. Because Wi-Fi, as y'all have seen today, connections can kind of come and go. The torrent's very forgiving. It's expecting pieces to be dropped or not come through complete and just keep retrying. So the torrent will actually work better. Now, it may take a day to download, 24 hours, because you're on Wi-Fi. Um, but it, it would eventually complete. Um, we actually, at one workshop, at, forgot to have people plug their Ethernets back in after we had them setting up wireless, and they engaged the Windows installer with 100 people over Wi-Fi, and I watched access points just melt and burst into flames, and it totally shut down the whole building. It was, it was awesome. It was great. Um, so, and we have things in there. You know, of course, this is the stuff nobody reads. Basically, don't do this if you've already done other partitioning and stuff, but it doesn't matter. It's going to bail anyway. Um, and we tell them, you know, you can only run it on certain Macs because Windows 7 has to be Intel Core 2 Duo. And they pick it. Um, if they decide they want to pick a particular size partition, here's where they do it. They'd hit Customize, hit another window. I'm just going to glaze through this. And when the script runs, they would just pick the size partition they would want. And verification. And here's kind of what they see. This is the iHook part. This is the feedback. It's just... You can just throw in your own background. We've got a little bar that goes, and this is where it starts tying into the scripting and feeding back what percentage are you in the download or the cloning. Um, we can say what percentage the download is. We can give them an upload rate and download rate, which is really more for us because the students know, don't know what we're doing. A few of them might. When you say torrent, they're like, what? Really? Cool. Um, I'm getting movies. Uh, but, 
But, but what we would love to do down the road is tie that and make it more, I'd love a graph showing me upload and download rates just for eye candy. We haven't went that far with it yet, but um, we can actually monitor and see, well, wait a minute, the upload rate's too slow, or you, know, you can kind of get a vibe in the room when you're looking at this thing running as to how fast or slow, uh, if you've got other network congestion or something happening. When you hit the cloning stuff, it'll just lock same verifying disk for a while while it's actually doing the partitioning, and then the same thing with the cloning percent. It can show you as you walk through, and this is where those hooks tie in that feed the percentage back. Just again, to give the user, because this moves slow. I mean, this thing takes about 20 to 30 minutes to run. So they're just sitting there watching that bar go 63, 64, and they're just sitting there. That's why we, they can web serve for text or whatever while we're doing it. But, um, too many people were killing it. And then when it's done, uh, have instructions telling them about that, but we usually walk it through. Because they've only finished the first half of the install, and we love to tell them that. After they've sat there for half an hour, good, you're done with the first half. Now the second, and you see the groans, because it's July and August, and we want to go outside and frolic and play, and now we're in here in the dungeon, because it is underground. Um, we're doing it, but uh, explain to them, of course, with normal sys prep, you're going to have multiple reboots. <clears throat> you're actually probably going to have an extra reboot here than what you guys are used to seeing, possibly. Because of doing the shrink hard drive step in WinClone, it tags check disk. So the first boot, Windows is going to come up and go, ah, something changed. Got to run check disk. You let that complete, it'll fluff it out to the, fit the right partition. Then it'll go into the second stage. Um, first steps, check disk. Whoop. Uh, then the second, you go through a series of three reboots. It'll do check disk, reboot. Then it'll do the hardware setup that you're used to seeing from SysPrep. Goes through, looks for the drivers. Hopefully all that goes well. Um, finishes, then it reboots a second time, and that's when it starts going into the operating system setup for that third and final. And that's where it'll stick. They'll create their username, password, get into their account, let it run anything like antivirus installation, things like that that we have to do post-imaging. <clears throat> and I'm not going to bore you with any of that. Um, some of the conclusions we've drawn personally from this, um, yeah, SysPrep was definitely the way to go, and I know some of you have already realized that. You don't want to get into hopping images. Um, I've seen too many people in areas doing that where they just try to make it or create an image for specific hardware. I used to do Dell and IBM Labs, and that was a nightmare. Um, I, I be, Lenovo's were a little more forgiving, but Dell's were just atrocious of any slight difference. They would just go crazy, um, and, and that's just a nightmare to maintain. I even had labs where they had two different model machines in one lab, so for one room you would have two images you would have to mirror. Um, you are very dependent on the Apple Boot Camp updates. Um, I would hate to have to try to go out and find all these drivers for all possible Apple hardware from the vendors one by one. That would be a nightmare. Luckily with Apple handing you that, um, it's just a simple matter of cracking it open and having it there and then just updating, cleaning it up as, as necessary. Um, <clears throat> other conclusions we drew, the web download is faster and like I say, uh, nine months out of the year, we will trip it back over to web download. It gives the user a quicker experience and it's not much load on our server when you've got one, two, three people hitting on occasion. Um, the, uh, the problem we had in the labs, of course, was our download times were going from five minutes up to almost an hour just for the download portion. And we were running well past the two hour window we had that we could do workshops. Um, overall, BitTorrent download, if you did a direct, direct comparison, and I expected it to be slower just because of the extra overhead of having to check some each piece and coordinating with the tracker. Um, I didn't expect it to be twice as long though. Um, instead of four to five minutes, it's around eight to ten minutes for it to download using the torrent. However, four to five minutes is great when you've got less than a dozen people. When you've got a hundred and you're up to an hour download, eight to ten is a lot better than an hour. It's consistent and honestly, the more pieces I have, the more consistently that runs. It's almost better. Uh, 100, 200, 1,000 clients, it would get better and better because the more clients there are, the more pieces there are and people to talk to, to trade to. To a certain point, I'm sure once you maximize the backbone of the um, bandwidth of the building, you'd be messed up. Yes? <clears throat> I was just curious if you would uh, if you have more seeds, if that brings that you just have more stuff. I honestly couldn't find much difference from one to a dozen seeds. Mainly because we're not talking about machines 
in different parts of the earth over the internet where you need seeds and your ping times might be higher or lower, your connection rates might be modem speed versus high bandwidth. And it's very consistent. We're in a known full gigabit network room. So there's enough consistency there that getting at least one copy of the seed literally is less than a minute. I mean, it's, I think I timed it out. Propagation speed, it's so quick at yes. the gigabit speed that, okay, you've got one seed, but yep. 30 seconds later, you've got, the neighbors is seeding out. You've got at least two. Of it, mm -hmm. And then it just snowballs. So yeah, well then, I mean, if you thought about it, if I've got 100 users and I'm giving each of them one one hundredth of the seed, different hundredths, different one percents, Within that, like I said, 30 seconds, there's a second copy already available. You don't even need a seed now. They've, they've got enough seeds to work it out. And within another 30 seconds, there's, you know, and it just, it mushrooms it. I would love to have some sort of network mapping to watch all of this work, but I haven't, I, I'm going to work with our uh, network guys this summer and see if I can't get them to tie in and try to get some of that data, because I would just love to see it and, and gaze at it and lay in bed with it and tuck up, you know. <laughs> I think it would look great. To visualize it to see the, uh, the amount of parts per client. Mm -hmm. So you would see the 100 clients, you know, after two minutes, the one's got 10%, and then you would see that growth. That would be a neat, yeah, because right now I don't track the number of pieces each client gets. We just track the upload and download rates that they're, and it'll vary from machine to machine. Um, give you a uh, percentage of completion of download. Mm -hmm. Just tracking that percentage on your 100 machines and graphing it. Show that would show that rise and drop, you know. Of your, of your that would be a good idea. I hadn't thought about that. But in our first iteration, we were just wanting to make sure it worked and was smooth. Now I'm actually wanting to add the eye candy and, and get more reporting data back and see it, what's going on behind it. Because this is all kind of behind the scenes and, and it's just happening and people don't know what's going on. It's, it's, it'd be nice to have some of that feedback. Um, the big thing here was just the consistency of that download time is irregardless how many seeds, how many clients, it stays 8 to 10 meg, uh, minutes to do from start to finish, irregardless, which is great when I'm dealing with a known constant instead of, I don't know how long our download is going to be today. You know, it could be longer, it could be, and the more people we had, the worse it got. So. Um, here's some of what we were talking about. This was direct web download traffic coming from our server during a period of time when we did that. Um, if you notice, the scale up there is 240 megs per second coming from the server for sustained periods. Our CPU level would also be pegged at 100%. And if you do the math, that's the theoretical max of a 2 gig uplink um, coming off the server. So that we were pretty much hitting that, as well as not just our server, but the uh, bottleneck of the building. So we're flooding the building when we were doing web downloads. No one else could do anything on the network you know, without feeling that pain. Of, of crunch when we were doing it. Yes, you had something. Just because I'm proctoring, um, we have about 10 minutes left. Oh, okay. You were I'm pretty close to done. Thank you very much, though. Um, by comparison, BitTorrent download. Notice the total difference in bandwidth traffic. This is coming from the server. We're floating between 40 and 80 megs. I'm at about one fourth, one third the bandwidth coming off my server, which would also mirror the amount of traffic coming and going from the building. So now instead of flooding the building's pipe, we're only using a third, so other people can still do other work. Um, this is also, now, if I engaged more seeds outside of that building, that traffic would increase for the bandwidth coming out of the building, but I don't want to do that. So if I was to run more seeds, I would do them locally so we're not hitting that bottleneck. So no, it wouldn't necessarily be advantageous for us to run more seeds outside of that area, but internal would be a good idea. Uh, but this just shows the difference in the server load, which was, to me, a side benefit. All my aim was when we went to BitTorrent was speed. I had to get that download time down. We only had two hours to do all this setup. An hour download time wasn't cutting it. I had to find some method to get that down to something more manageable. Me not beating my server to death with 100% CPU cycles for an hour at a time or the network bandwidth getting clogged for an entire building and ticking off a bunch of faculty and staff was a side benefit. Um, secondary, but um, it's definitely been a lot lighter load on the server and for when these things are running. Um, and the CPU cycle is around the same thing, 10, 20 percent. The tracker piece really isn't, doesn't handle much at all. Oh, did my time run out? <laughs> Low battery. I'll talk louder. Um, but that, that was a side benefit. We weren't running at the processors. Um, 
And the beauty of once this is cached in RAM, it doesn't even do hard drive writes on the server. It's just pumping it out over, over the straight memory cards. Is it? Oh, yeah. Okay. I feel like money. Um, as I said, less intensive on the server, less intensive on the structure, uh, the infrastructure network from the building, which makes the network guys happy. So if they give you any resistance about opening up torrent stuff, let them know. This is going to make their lives a little easier. They're going to get less calls about congestion if you're doing something heavy like this. It really does uh, lighten that. Less CPU, and it's more secure also because of the fact everything's being checksummed. For the future, things we've been considering, and we've kind of talked about some of this as we're going through parts of it. Um, definitely want to add in mountain lion compatibility. We're going to be looking at the new version of Wing Clone and seeing how that uh, ropes into this, and, and, and hopefully it will continue to be developed. Um, so I guess Monday I'll be buying a site license from the guy, presuming it works okay. Um, I'm anticipating having to do something with mountain lion because every installer I've tested so far with the beta seed, and I guess I'm not violating NDA with Apple, um, it's broken, crashed everything. I've even had machines that won't even boot again after I've done stuff. So. I'm anticipating a lot of work ahead. Um, and then we're actually considering maybe even just scrapping the whole thing and rebuilding from scratch, maybe an Objective-C, just so we have a little better control instead of it actually being a package deployment, have it running as an app, they download, run it, and then we can get some of those graphical feedbacks of torrents and you name it. That, that gives us a lot better control over the user's experience of how they're doing. The back end would still pr pretty much be the same parts and pieces, I'm sure, but we could tie in better and give a little better user feedback there. Um, plus, it'd be a great thing to help me hone up on Objective-C again. Um, here's some of the websites and links for any of those pieces, if you weren't already familiar um, with where to go to get those. Uh, you can find tons of info about Package Maker from Apple. It's actually part of their development tools, and but I think they've changed that now in Lion. Yeah. It's somewhere else now. Yeah, uh, with Xcode 4.1, I think Right. Uh, you can kind of put it wherever, but I think that the fact that is to put within the Xcode app, there's an application folder within there, and you can mm -hmm. drop it in. And yeah. Yeah. And I knew that had moved around and confused a few of our developers. Um, you can get. Right now, there's a stop and bundle downloads for their developer accounts. Command line tools. First of all, there's a command line, but there's another one called also where you can build them. Yeah. That's good. Right. Yeah. So, and I'm definitely going to be delving if we rebuild that going through. Uh, uh, Xcode and everything else will be looking at that, which at this point I would probably tend to build it for Mountain Lion, just knowing it's on the horizon rather than going backwards. I try to follow Apple's idea of ever forward and, and the people who are on older stuff will just go away within a year or two and I don't have to worry about it. Um, that's kind of when we started building this. At the time, Tiger was, and Le Leopard had just come out and we were not doing Tiger. Yeah, we know it's only six months old, but ever forward just, and that problems went away. So. Um, Windows Automated Installation Kit, you can download from Microsoft Direct. Uh, there's tons of info out there about how to do it and use it. If you have anybody who's done it or used it before, I would recommend you take them to lunch, help you walk through, because it's got a little bit of weirdness to it. Um, our expanders, freeware you can get, and that's just for cracking open the boot camp pieces. Uh, Two Canoes website uh, is where you can get Wing Clone and purchase it from there. And here's where I got some of the, uh, the BitTorrent clients from those various websites for each of them. Uh, Rivet Tracker is also out. I can't remember if it's donationware or freeware. I think it's freeware. Um, Maps open, and so iHook as well. Oh, was it University of Michigan did iHook, I believe? And but they've actually posted it out uh, open source source forge now. I don't think it's been updated, but it still works, and it's kind of handy, especially if you haven't done it in a lab thing, just to give user feedback. It's it's nice to use. Um, gives you an in between. And here's my contact info. If anybody has like info or ideas or things you've tried and worked and didn't, please feel free to contact me. Let me know. I would love to always go with the new stuff. Anything that makes it stronger, better, faster. How's that song go? Yes. Um, the main primary script I have posted, I will probably go back and post that. Um, Sysprep unattend file, um, just because it 
it's a generic. I think you could recreate it. You wouldn't want to necessarily do it the way we do, depending on your environment. Um, but it only does a few steps, but I can post that as well. I might just go ahead and wrap up the whole tool, tool set. Just keep in mind, you're going to want to read through that because it's catered for our environment. I tried to generalize the file I did post to the main one, um, but you, there are pieces you're going to need to go in and edit and definitely test. test. And don't test on your CIO's machine. Um, if you don't know better, because uh, you are doing some really funky things here. I mean, we haven't lost any user data ever, but you're partitioning hard drives. You're, I mean, you're doing stuff where things could go wrong. Um, luckily, there's enough. If you can't partition the stuff, things are going to bail out on you anyway, so that if you've got hard drive issues or problems, they're going to rear their head before you get too deep into monkeying with the user's data. But, of course, we tell them, you know, you should have a backup anyway of your stuff before you do it, just because we are doing some, some deep stuff to the machines. But it goes pretty well. It's doing what you would do essentially manually using boot camp, just walking you through that process. It's just automated. And the only twist we have in there of that scripted out automated procedure, which we're handing them as a package and saying run this, is we have BitTorrent tacked in on the back end now, just for our benefit of when we're in a situation of heavy loads of users. Um, it was a different twist. Like I say, I got the idea of it from a group that was using it to do Linux labs, and they were pushing their labs doing it through BitTorrent. Um, I'd have to dig up that info somewhere. I didn't think I should have put that in there. Um, but they were, they were seeing a direct benefit of doing it from a lab management standpoint. So if anybody decides to try to do that, if your network guys are forgiving enough to let you try, it's, it's really awesome. It can, it can do that as well. The biggest thing that I'm looking for is like when you're showing the package maker uh, screenshots, you know, all those scripts and the package the students actually download and all that stuff working in the back end. That's what I would like to see if you can. Yeah, sure. That. I'll, I'll wrap that up and, and stick it there on that blog site at the bottom. Um, and make that available. Um, I'll update the entry I did at 2 a.m. this morning. Um, it's probably why I'm dragging. Um, and have that in there so it has the full wrapped up, because really that is where 90% of the work's doing. The rest is all just making it look pretty for the user. The, the heavy lifting's really that main installer script that does the wind clone portions. <laughs> uh, and I can't give wind clone enough credit. It's, it's, it's really, and I don't, are there really any other Windows deployment Mac side other than like Deploy Studio or some big packaging, like an actual, just an app that like NetRestore used to just here, this is a one trick pony and WinClone's been the only one I found and that's why I got really spooked when they dropped development for a while that there was no other option and what was I gonna do and um, I've played with Casper, we're not using Casper at all, we're at our facility, so. Um, it's, it's interesting how many, I mean you guys tell me, I. Half my job's dealing with the Windows stuff, even though I'm Mac admin. Yeah, you can't get away from it. Um, whether it be you're dual, dual booting a lab, or you've just got users that are dual booting machines, or clients who just want to use Parallels or VMware, or VirtualBox, or some sort of VM client, um, you're going to be wrestling with it at some some degree and some level. So um, it's really interesting how Mac support's not just Mac support, and and how the vendors take into that. But any other questions? Yes. Yes, definitely. I want to see your time, see if your times change if you move it to like a 15 meg or a 32 meg chunk. I would think they would just because you've got less overhead there in the pieces. Um, like I say, I, I was under 2,000 pieces when I was around 8 gigs on the image file, but as it's crept up to 10 gigs, I've gotten over that 2,000 mark, and I'm just getting spooked because of everything I read and from our testing. Once you got over a certain level of pieces, it actually started to degrade the speed because of what the tracker was trying to handle. Um, but getting too few of pieces mean you've got, you know, you, you, yeah, you're, well, the download chunks, and if there's a glitch in the network or like somebody's doing it over Wi-Fi, you're not going to get the whole piece before something glitches out, and then you're resending data, and so you have a speed degradation because you're sending that 10 gig file 50% more times, you know, or something. So, yes? Forgive me if I missed this. <clears throat> How are you handing off, or is it BTPD handles it automatically, the uh, transition if tracker's unavailable to HTTP? What handles that? That's in the main installer script. Um, and actually, I didn't show that because it's it just, just built in there. there. If it's not, then it goes to HTTP. 
the way BTPD works is it's constantly monitoring your traffic, your uh, upload and download speed. And if that download speed ever drops to zero, it bails. Um, now I will say it takes a while because of the way it's constantly calculating it. So say I've got 20% into my download and my download speed's 40 megs a second. Well now I've dropped connection for whatever reason. After a while it'll go to 30 and then 20 and then it creeps down as time goes on getting closer and closer to zero. But I don't actually have it bail because you never know. It could just be Wi-Fi, could be, God help you, the person's running it over a MiFi and a hotel room or something. Uh, but for whatever reason, it just kind of keeps trailing that along as it gets lower and lower until, okay, it's finally hit zero, then yeah, we're down, we're down to kilobytes and zero. And then it just bails. And, yeah, once that happens, I just have it kill that process daemon, flush anything it may have downloaded, even if worst case scenario, you're at 99%. It just flushes that because it's no good at this point, and then kicks over to web download and just direct and, and attempts it that way. If you fail there, then you, you need to find a better network. Yeah, so. Require what? iHook's iHook. just an intermediary that's piece. Nice that's just feedback for the user. If you were using this in, say, a lab deployment scenario and you don't care about, you could forget the iHook por portion. We added that in. The first year we didn't have that. We just had the Package Maker installer, which we don't have any control over the feedback. And so Package Maker would say, you have one minute remaining for 30 minutes. And the user gets spooked after 15, and they would force quit, reboot, shut down. And now they've got a botched up install and saying we're idiots because we didn't do it right. Um, that's just to give them better feedback to let them know this is going to take time. It is moving. It is not frozen. And that way they'll leave things alone. So It is. Um, there's commands you can issue to that process daemon while it's running to get status updates. So you can, that main installer scripts every five seconds or so hitting the process daemon. Okay, where are you at now? Where are you at now? How much have we got? What's our speed? Upload, download, and we can, and we actually have that output in just text right now. Upload rate. Here's your download rate. Percentage in the bar moves, and it just keeps looping through that constantly talking to the process daemon until it finishes. Once it finishes, then we kill that. Um, a side note, we did toy at one time with leaving the torrent because of what we were talking about, that ramp up and drop down time, actually leave the torrent running on the machine after they're done downloading. But when you hit partitioning, it was going to freeze up anyway for a while. It impacted our cloning procedure because now the machine is trying to do all that cloning and your cloning rate honestly here sucks because you're cloning f within one hard drive from one partition to another so your read write speeds about half true yeah it's, it's and it's and it's uncompressing you're doing gun zip at the same time so it's chugging along that that actually takes longer than anything um but we had toyed with the idea of, well, what if we just had it housed, you know, like the image when we were doing the web download? What if we had it cloned directly from that network mount, similar to what you were doing, going to get the drivers and just feed in? But that was so susceptible to the network speed, and there really wasn't that much of a gain because you were still pounding the network doing a web direct. By doing the BitTorrent, we're getting it all local, and then we can cut the network out of the procedure. The rest, like I say, they could literally walk out of the room and it'll complete. Anyway, they could leave, shut it at the end of that, and let the sysprep stuff finish on their own time. Um, it just gets us on the network, get what we need, and get off the network as fast as possible. And we decided not to continue letting the torrent run because even if you, you're the last person left and you're still missing pieces and everybody else's torrent shut off, we've still got the seed on the main server. It can still go get those pieces from there, and you're still going to get a good connection speed. So even that ramp down, it was better just to shut it off because it was impacting the cloning times. Uh, 10 and 15 minutes were getting added trying to do that at the same time, and it wasn't worth it. Yes? Uh, one of the things I've noticed uh, using the Voice Studio is they also run Zip and stuff like that. Um, I don't know exactly how I did it, but basically the guns that built into OS X uh, isn't multi-threaded aware, so we have all these multi-core systems, but it's only using one thread out of multi-core. That's true in this too, yeah. So there, there's an open source project for a parallel gun zip. Ooh. Yes, and it's very cool because I have the network monitor, the CPU monitoring tool on my server, which is the XServe with 16 threads. Mm -hmm. So you use 1,600% of your CPU. is really cool to watch, um, but it, it really helps. I went from uh, you know a 10-minute decompress on, uh, I forgot what I was doing again, but from 
10 minutes down to a minute and a half using the parallel. You're going to be my new best friend. <laughs> I, I need all this. Yeah, this is what so my new is actually. I'm going back and doing this. That, that load is on the server. Get it, like it's gun zipping it and then sending the uncompressed over there? I think what it is is when you pull an image using Deploy Studio, it puts it in the temp directory on the server and then it compresses it on the server. Right. If you replace within the Deploy Studio oh, script, for the compression. For the compression. Oh, right. if, you, if you replace the Deploy Studio script with parallel gun zip, it really fast. Um, so between disk I.O. And yeah, anything that could multi, because especially with the machines now having so many threads. You're coming to scold me for going over, aren't you? No. Oh, okay. No, um, can't scold you for not using the mic. Uh, it won't. Is there only one? I have no wireless. Died, so, so. Wireless well, yeah, my wireless one died. I'm on this, and this doesn't have much slack. Okay, I got you new batteries. So, no problem. Um, we're about to wrap up anyway, though. Um, but yeah, uh, anything that could multi thread and speed up that cloning, because that right now, you know, it's just a shifting bottleneck of anything and right now that cloning would be the one thing if I could speed it up I would definitely want to and, and since we are doing it gun zip definitely send me that info as well I would love to now that the machines have you know multiple cores four cores that would be a great benefit because um, some of them do drag MacBooks there's a difference why you pay for that and you see it in things like this um, all the pros get out 15 minutes ahead of the, the MacBooks easily so um, yeah the white one uh, and don't even, I have had people do the MacBook Airs with this over wireless. It'll work. You got to be patient. So, I have the dongle in my backpack. Yeah, I usually, but I had two show up at one session. I only had one dongle. So, the, the lady got it because I'm a gentleman like that. Mm -hmm. Hmm. It's interesting. Yeah. And that boot off of it. Okay. Dope. Because he's trying to mic you. Like the <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just saying that uh, I've heard of people getting the uh, cheap USB Ethernet adapters. I think off Mono Price, which mm -hmm. supposedly are much the performance is much better, but you can't do net boot with them yes. because hmm. they're, they're the the Apple string isn't actually present in the adapter. And I think they went after a company once who was That's who was illegitimately advertising as an Apple adapter, and then they. My favorite story of Apple making something proprietary just to be mean uh, was back in the day of iPods where you could do video feeds out the headphone jack. Apple sold a special RCA adapter connector for like 40 bucks that was their proprietary da da da, -da. And, and one of my coworkers and I finally figured out one day you could take a standard Radio Shack RCA cable for $5 and if you flipped the, I think it was the left audio with the video, it worked. That was their whole thing. They just wired it internally differently to make it where a normal one wouldn't work with the iPod, so you'd buy their $40. Yeah. So. I um, was a long time ago that the first uh, Microsoft mouse in the days of Windows 3.1 had mm -hmm. a right button for copyright issues because Apple had like, patented the one button mouse. Oh. So they were, you know, for had a while the there was that right click that didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. Apparently, you know, it's so like the old USBs where they put the notch in them. That's accurate. Just that's to be made. Um, well, no more questions. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you coming. Thank you.